So, um, well, you know, so, so let me just say, uh, I'll, I'll drop some preliminary remarks. Um, we did a stream last week that was impromptu. It was unplanned, uh, where I had been trying to solve an animation problem and Casey dropped in with uh, some comments on that. And then that sort of dovetailed out into a broader discussion and people seem to enjoy that. So we're gonna do that again. And we had attempted to uh, be a little bit more prepared this time, but you see what happens now with modern computers. When you try to do that, it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, uh, so we're going ahead with, with a less multimedia presentation uh, than we had planned. It's actually about exactly the same case as last time where Casey is on audio only. And we're going to talk about compiler stuff, probably starting with parsing. And then after that, who knows? So <clears throat> I actually have a, uh, if you, if you want to, John, and uh, you know, tell me if you would rather not do this, but I actually have sort of a introduction to this that I thought about because I kind of know exactly what it is that I wanted to ask you about first. And I think I can give a quick explanation of why I wanted to ask you that. So if you don't mind jumping right into that. I yeah, that would be there. great. Um, but if you'd rather do, if you had something in mind you wanted to go over first, we can do that instead for sure. No, that's so. good. So somebody on stream suggested me popping a screen share so you'd have a lower latency. And why can I, have... I not hear John all of a sudden? Hello? Hello, hello. So I cannot hear John now. So okay, so so the reason you couldn't okay. hear me yes. is somebody suggested that I do screen share on Discord. So I popped open a screen share, and then that started streaming video to you, and instantly your voice quality dropped a little bit, and I guess it stopped sending audio from me as well. <sighs> so, so you can't even have a low latency screen share. That's just... I don't know what it is what do. it is. Yeah, no, it's all it's all garbage. OK, anyway. So, yes, let's start the way that you suggest. I heard everything you said and my okay. stream heard everything you said. So that's fine. OK, so uh, what I wanted to talk about was the following thing. So when you are initially going to write something like a programming language, obviously the parser is the first thing that you have to write because you need to take source files and get them into mm. whatever the heck it is that you're actually going to be doing. And usually what happens here is if you kind of know a little bit about how you might implement sort of the even most naive part of your programming language, it's a thing that's like, okay, I know how to imperate, I know how to implement like operator plus. If I just have something on one side I can evaluate to an integer and something on the other side I can evaluate to an integer, I can write the plus operator by taking the two oper by taking the two sides and adding them together. So in my mind, when I'm thinking I need to go start down this road, yeah. I'm thinking, how do I produce something that can get me into a position where I can start to do the thing I do know how to do, which is imp implement like that plus operator or something, right? Yes. So the parser, <clears throat> you then go, well, I don't know anything about parsing because it's not really like anything else that I do in programming. So I'm going to go read about how you do parsing. And then immediately, right, you're hit with a tremendous amount of theoretical baggage yes. that's like, here's the theory of what constitutes like a tokenizer and then how a tokenizer reads like left to right or right to left reduce mm -hmm, reductions mm -hmm. in, and rules and uh, context free grammars and all these sorts of things. Yeah. And in general, I find that the more I unlearn that stuff, the easier it gets to actually write a parser. But I strongly suspect, especially by now, but probably just even before, you are much better at just conceptualizing what actually needs to happen in a parser mm. and in what order it should happen than I am. So I was wondering if you could walk us through just even just how you think about it. So I you yes. want to sit down and write a parser. What is your first thought about how to start doing things like producing the token stream in a way that like obeys operator precedence and that sort of stuff so it doesn't yeah. become complicated? Well, yeah. Okay. So... I have relatively contrarian views on these things, as you know. So Excellent. whatever I say is going to make some people upset, you know, especially people who are paying $20,000 a year to learn this stuff in school that I think is not that helpful. Um, 
So let me just lay out my history here, right? Like I started doing uh, programming languages when I was in college, right? Uh, instead of doing my actual classwork. <laughs> and um, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and since then, I've probably, this current one is probably my 11th or 12th programming language, right? But most of them were not, in fact, none of them were really production quality, like what you or I would consider a serious production quality language, except for this last one, right? Okay. Um, but, you know, the parsing, like you say, you kind of have to do that to have a programming language. So like I've done that 12 times in different ways. Um, early on, I did it just like they say in school. So I used, um, uh, I don't even think we had Bison back then. So I was using like Lex and Yak, like where Lex is a, is a lexical analyzer generator, which is a thing that generates the tokens. And we'll talk about what that actually means in a little bit. Um, I used to use Yak, which is a, a different domain specific language. So Lex is like regular expressions. You kind of write regular expressions for what your different things are like this is a number and this is an identifier and all this stuff, right? And uh, yak is uh, a thing that's more about writing grammar rules, right? So like a, if you see this token and that token and that token, then that's a function call, right? Or whatever. Um, and both of those are domain specific languages. And so the, the problem is by the time you connect both of those with your actual program, you have three different domain specific languages all talking to each other, uh, which is a lot of overhead to take. Um, and you start bumping up into the limits of those other languages. Those earlier tools had a lot of, they were very limited. They had a lot of restrictions. Uh, their error messages were terrible. You know, if you make a mistake, then as you know, the, the time taken to correct the mistake can vary tremendously based on how good is the information that you, the compute, the compiler, or whatever program gives you. Right. And so, um, you know, all of those tools are very limited. And to this day, right. Um, or, or what I realized very early on was like, look, okay. If instead of using Lex, like, okay, I've been using C for a year or two now. I see how to program all this stuff. Lex makes you write little snippets of C that you put in there anyway, but it would be just simpler if I just emitted the tokens and then just only used Yak to do the grammar stuff. And so I did that first, right? And I liked it more. <laughs> uh, it was much easier to use and stuff. And then eventually I was like, you know, why am I doing all this grammar stuff? It's annoying, the error messages are annoying and good error messages are very important, not only for you while you're developing the system, but like if you're gonna go to a user, right? Um, the error messages are sort of the user interface to the programming language. And if you give your that's users- That's a very interesting way to say that. It's a good yes. point because that's pretty much the input is the compiler flags and the output is the error messages. And that's pretty much what you've got. Yeah. And, and so again, the usability of your programming language, it of course depends on the actual features of the language, but a big, big part of the usability is how well does it communicate to you about what is wrong? And the problem is, when you have this general system in there sitting in there and doing parsing, okay, there's a few different categories of errors that are very common, right? Um, and one of the most common ones is a parse error. Like, oh, you, you gave me something that doesn't look like something valid in this language, right? There are other yeah. errors that, that happen later, like type checking errors and stuff, but parse, er parse errors are really kind of common, you know? And so you want them to be good. And the problem is if you have a generic tool that, that is kind of being a black box to you and your program is certainly a black box to it because the authors of that tool don't know what's going on with your program, obviously, then you, you have this great degree of friction between, um, or that, that impedes uh, making good error messages, right? But then lastly, you know, I just didn't like that stuff. Like the, there's this paradigm that those parser generators use, right? Um, you know, it's called LR parsing. We're not gonna go into any of that. Like, um, but you know, usually it's considered an idea, a good idea if your parser is like LR1 or whatever, um, which means that if you wanna generate the output uh, tree, we'll explain, actually, it'll be a good idea to explain why it's usually a tree in a minute. Um, but if you want to generate this, what's called the syntax tree from your program text, 
um, people would really obsess about like, well, you shouldn't look ahead more tokens than you need and whatever, and so they'd classify grammars according to this. None of that actually matters, dude. If you want to look ahead 100 tokens, it's trivial on a modern computer, and it's just as fast. Like, if you were yeah. trying to build some state machine that had like one byte of memory, then these things would matter. Um, but it totally well, doesn't. A lot of the work they did back then was, was really focused on this, too. It was like, look, we're really trying to to turn this into a transition table so that like the entire parser can just be this transition table that we run through. And like nowadays it just isn't relevant. Like that is not the slow part of the program. And so it is, it's obvious that you wouldn't make that trade off. Like yeah. if you could get, if you could get anything out of not doing it basically. Yeah. Um, so it is all just to say that Today, when I write a compiler, um, what I do when I write the parser, the way I say it is you just write regular everyday code. It's not special. It's not scary. It's not rocket science. It's just regular code that reads the text and makes a tree. And, and again, well, it's, it, it, we should probably explain about those things, but... Um, let me, let me explain actually what I do think is valid about the academically taught uh, concepts and why, right? There's a, because there's a couple things that are pretty important. Um, and if you do them, you'll save a lot of pain. And if you don't do them, uh, you'll take a lot of pain, right? So one of them is you do want this distinction between... Uh, you do want a stage that, that converts text to tokens and then tokens to parsing. Like that is a place that's a good pl place to factor the job of parsing. Like if parsing seems like a big job, right? One of the ways in software generally that we break or we make a big job tractable is we break it into smaller jobs that are all well-defined, right? Or, see, I almost don't know, like job is now a threading word. And then I, <laughs> then I tried to say like smaller tasks, but that's also a threading word. Um, but you smaller break it. Smaller problem. We're yeah. breaking it down to smaller problems. Yeah, I'm sure some programming language uses that as a reserved word, but. Well, promises um, are now in JavaScript, yeah. right? So you can't even use the word exactly. promise anymore, but yes. Um, so, you know, you, you break your large problem into sub problems that are all uh, easier to understand and then you solve them one at a time and you hook them together and usually in the process of doing that you'll realize that hooking them together was more complicated than you wished it did but at least you made it a tractable, tractable problem that you can make progress on right mm -hmm. so if you're just looking like here on my screen I have a bunch of program text right this is actually C++ text um, there's just a bunch of words here but there's different kinds of words right so some of them are keywords in the language which are like um, there are a small set of predefined things that have very uh, very rigid meanings. Usually, actually, in C++, that's not quite true, because if you see the word static, what the hell does that mean, right? Um, but usually, you know, they're, they're very well-defined and clear. Uh, you have other things, like maybe names that you, as the user, came up with, like get hex digit here, or this word lexer. Uh, and then you have punctuation, which is usually very easy to understand, because it's only a couple characters, right? And those fall into pretty discrete classes of things. And so to pre-digest those classes of things early into different categories of stuff so that, so that when you go trying to parse these more complex uh, aggregations of, of, uh, of symbols, right, that you're working on a little bit of a higher level and you don't have to care about the individual text characters anymore. That is actually very useful. So this idea that there's this idea and it's how they teach it in academia and it's still the way I do it. You have this thing called the lexical analyzer or people call it the lexer these days. Like there's honestly not very much analysis that happens. Like calling it a, an analyzer of any kind is probably just because people came up with this in the 1950s or 1960s when computers didn't do very much, right? Um, but so the lexical analyzer or the lexer is the thing that um, will uh, read the text character by te character and will output things called tokens, right? And so tokens are 
like one step up from characters. Uh, and what they are can vary. So if you have like a name of a variable or something, that's usually called an identifier, right? And that could be any number of characters. So this is a five character identifier. Uh, this is a this peak next character. That's a much longer identifier, right? And so the Lexer's job is to say, okay, this thing is an identifier. Um, let's then tell the parser, oh, here's an identifier. And then when you care about the name of the identifier, here's the string. And so, um, like here, I, I'm starting to flip, Casey will get this in a second, but I'm starting to flip through um, the actual code for this compiler. And there's this enum that assigns numeric values to all these different types of, types of tokens that we have. And there's a lot. Um, um, but identifier is right here, for example. So anytime there's a name of a variable or anything in our programming language, we make a data structure. That data structure is a token structure. Let's see, uh, it's this thing. I should clean up my, my indentation here. Um, so it's got some various information. It's got a type. And that type is something like identifier. And then it's got some additional information like where in the program text did this happen? And then there's some information that tells you things about it. So if it was the name of a variable, then here's the text of that name that you can use, right? Uh, if it's an integer, right? Or if it's a float or whatever, these tell you the actual values of the things, right? And then there's maybe some other flags that we use. And so what the parser gets is a stream of these. It doesn't get the actual text, right? Anyway, so an identifier is one thing, um, a keyword. So here union would be a keyword. That would just be a token that says union is the type and there's no additional information because the word union is like always the same anytime you see it, right? There's not, there's not anything else to say about it. So that's a very simple token. You would still pass in this entire struct because all these structs are the same size. We just wouldn't use any of this extra data because we don't care. Um, something like a semicolon or a brace um, would be its own token. And in this compiler, and I think this is kind of common, we actually reserve space for those. So um, the reason I start identifier at 256 is just because I'm saving everything from zero to 255 for ASCII characters that are their own token, right? So if you see comma, then it's just the ASCII code for comma. And that just prevents me from having to define a bunch of stuff. Um, I did make names for some. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why I did it just for these ones. I wanted that for some reason. But most of the one character tokens are like invisible in this enum space. And I don't know if that's clean or messy, honestly, but it's the way that I've done it for a long time. Um, so does that make sense? I mean, it certainly makes sense to me. I guess uh, if I had to uh, sort of, if I had to sort of guess any sort of questions that people might be having about that sort of thing, I guess I would add <clears throat> maybe one slight clarification, which is just that you can also think about lexical analysis and then parsing as just two phases of parsing, right? Because there's nothing particularly special about lexical analysis. Yes. Really all we're talking about is, look, we've got to identify things in this programming language by what they mean, but what we're given is just a giant bag of ASCII garbage. Now, yep. you could, in theory, try to write a parser that did everything in sort of one go, yep. but it becomes incredibly complicated to do that because you're looking at individual ASCII characters and making decisions about what to do each time you see one. So typically what's actually happening here is people have just sort of said over time that if we break up this into two effectively passes, even though they don't necessarily have to happen w one entirely than the other, they can happen sort of in serially. Mm -hmm. If we just break this up into let's parse ASCII characters into clumps first yep. and then just pass the clumps to another parser, yep. this helps us keep the code more manual. It's a good split point on the problem, right? And yes. so lexical analyzer is just another word for simple parser of ASCII into something slightly more. And that's exactly what John just showed. Those are called tokens. And 
your token struct actually looks quite a bit like my token struct, so I'm guessing that when sensibly written, they tend to kind of look like this one way or the other. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, there's some information that you want, so to give good error messages, you want to know where it is, right? Yep. <laughs> if you can't tell somebody where it is, you have a problem. Um, yep. Now, you might think about trying to emit this stuff and just say, well, we're going to report what's the, like really old compilers would do this. They would just say, well, the lexer knows how far into the file it is. So we're just going to say that. But, you know, sometimes you peek ahead a token or some number of tokens, mm -hmm. or as Casey alluded to, you might actually want the choice of for pre-parsing your file, for example, in parallel even, or pre-lexing your file in parallel, and then just pulling the tokens off, right? I don't yeah. actually do that right now. What I do is if I go to the parser file for a second, um, people say peak next token all the time. And that's just in the middle of the parser. And that will either cause the lexer to return something that it has cached because somebody else already peaked it, or it'll read the next however many characters it needs to read and uh, return the token. Now, one thing that's worth saying is um, one thing I do not do because this is a modern compiler is I don't do F reads in here. Um, what I do is I say, when we're going to set input from a new text file, I read the entire text file and then we're just operating on memory. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, that's much cleaner. You don't have to like call out to anybody's, you don't have to make any system calls after this when you're analyzing things. Um, Somebody's going to say, but what if there's a 16 gigabyte source file? And my answer to that is, does your other compiler that does F reads work successfully with a 16 gigabyte source file? Call me back on that, right? Um, also, buy more memory. Yeah. Also, a 16 gigabyte file would be such a big program that... Um, I don't even know. But yeah, like your modern operating system has virtual memory, most high level, high level or high, I don't know what you call it, uh, non-embedded device operating systems have virtual memory. And so you would spill out to virtual memory in that case or whatever. But um, yeah, so we don't, we don't do F reads. We just read the file and that lets us crank through it very fast. It would be a relatively small um, change to set it up so that I would pre-lex a file in a separate thread, and then that peak next token call would just like, you know, take a semaphore and then grab the next thing out of the queue or whatever, right? Um, we don't do that right now. We actually do lex on demand. It, it doesn't matter too much. The thing is, the parser is so fast that, that um, it, it doesn't matter. You know, it, like, like parsing, oh, parsing all together. I actually don't remember how long it is, but it's less than 5% of compile time right now. So, you know, I'm I just, would also I'm suggest a few it. things about that actually performance wise that are related. The first one is I may be not that obvious, but at least somewhat clear, which is that the better the language, the smaller the source files anyway, generally speaking, because you're doing more with less. Sure. So typically, the phases after parsing are going to be the more uh, costly ones because the better the language, the less you have to type to get it to do something, right? That said, also, it's the easiest thing to speed up separately if you needed to, because since you can just prelex a file, you could cache all the files and only relex the ones that change. So again, it's really like the least concerning part of the process because yeah. it's the thing that doesn't really depend on anything else. Yeah, and so this is actually also very worth saying is that both both just lexical an analysis by itself and also lexer plus parser is a very compartmentalized problem. And for that reason, it's a very easy problem compared to other things in compilers. Like when you get later on in a compiler, right, you have like optimization passes that only can make sense if certain preconditions are met that need to be, you know, things just tangle together a lot more. Whereas the job of the parser is just like, look, we're going from text to a syntax tree. And as long as you generate the same form of syntax tree, you're fine. So it's even yeah. though it comes in the front of the compiler, right? It's kind of like leaf code in that way. It's kind of like calling cosine or something where yeah. it yeah. doesn't really interact with other things. Well, 
if you have a reasonably designed programming language. So one of the problems with C and that C++ inherited is that there are features like type def and maybe some other things that were implemented in a very unfortunate way many decades ago, and we're still paying for it. So yeah. because of type def in C and pound and, define, well, pound define is sort of a, a pre-pass, right? So it's a little different, but, um, well, I just mean it creates a lot of dependencies between files that shouldn't really be there because oh, whenever yeah. you pound define things, those things could expand out to arbitrary, like anything really. So you have to, you can't do simple caching behavior. You yes. know what I mean? Like, like you, if you try to do fancy caching behavior and you're not really paying attention, you end up with something like Visual Studio that just produces bad code all the time because it like screwed up understanding that a change in file X affects file Y and so on. Yes. Um, that's one kind of problem is you end up, you know, if you don't think things out in the right way, you can end up with very large performance problems for reasons like that, right? Yeah. Like in, include was, uh, I, I don't know. Pe people didn't originally think it was going to be a big performance problem, and it ended up being that. Yep. Um, th there's a second class of problem, though, which is actually when your parser can't even be clean in principle anymore, even ignoring things like caching and whatever. So the problem with type def in C and C++ is that when you see something that looks like an identifier, right, um, the statement will parse, especially now that C++ has like overloaded everything a bazillion ways, right? If that identifier happens to be the name of a type, it'll parse one way. And if it happens to not be the name of a type, if it's just a variable, it'll parse another way. And the problem is your parser needs to output the right thing, but it can't know that without having parsed everything prior to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't know if it was a type def or not, right? Yep. And so that is something that you want to avoid, right? You want to avoid um, uh, you want to avoid the parser needing to know about potentially far away pieces of the program in order to be correct, right? Um, and so if you did do something like that, I would also say like the C case is particularly bad because they did that but they didn't really get very much from it. Like if you somehow introduced this amazing language feature that just was like fantastic and it required this, then okay. But in the C case, it's like it just made things worse and don't really get much from it. No, it would have been a small change to the grammar long ago yes. to fix that, but now everything is built on top of that. I will point out there are, there are some tricks sometimes that you can do, right? Because an extra thing to understand is that the tree that the parser outputs doesn't have to be, um, I almost want to say like a definitive solution or something. I almost don't know how to say it. So let me just say what the example is, right? I'm going to, I'm just going to type some examples in this language. Um, I'm going to have a, a struct called a sandwich, right? And if you define a sandwich, it's got a weight and a name and a flavor is uh, some enum. All right. So uh, that's what a struct looks like in this language that I'm making. Um, and if you were writing some code somewhere, like you have a main, you might say uh, s is make sandwich. Like you're calling some function to make a sandwich and you're providing the weight, right? Okay. So that's totally normal. This is a procedure call. So when you're doing a parsing, this make sandwich gets a, a node in the syntax tree that says it's a procedure call, and then it's got some information about what procedure it is, and then some information about what the arguments are, right? So that's a totally normal thing. Um, but in, well, let me, let me say what make sandwich would be. Uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna type it out. It's just, just put a dot, dot, dot in there. It doesn't matter. So there's I mean, just it makes function. a sandwich. It makes what a sandwich. What more do you need to know? Yeah. Okay, so the thing in this language is that we also, um, can put parameters on structs. And I didn't want to do things like the really gross C++ template metaprogramming way of doing that. Um, and there are other various ergonomic reasons for why I do this, but you know, you can put up parameters on your struct and it looks like a parameter list to a procedure. So I could say something like, um, I don't know, uh, number, uh, number of 
uh, meat slices, right, which is an int, but this number of meat slices has to be known at compile time. All right, I'm sorry to the vegetarians out there. You, vegetarians can have number of meat slices zero, that's valid. And then down here, I'm gonna say, you know, slices is number of meat slices of uh, meat type, right, which is some other enum. So here we've got an array um, that's this many items long, and, uh, but it has to be known at compile time because the kind of programming language this is, is that we don't make new types at runtime. That's part of how you are fast and how you detect errors at compile time is, you know, everything is resolvable like that. Okay, so this is a struct declaration, but the point here is that, um, well, uh, let's, let's, um, Let's just simplify things as much. We're just not even going to look at a return value. We're going to call make sandwich of 3.0. And make sandwich is going to say um, s is a sandwich with uh, like five meat slices because we're really hungry. Um, we're going to initialize the meat slices here, except we're not because we're not going to type that stuff. Um, and then uh, we're going to say s dot weight is weight, right? And then uh, output eats and we're just going to eat it. I mean, right. I know it's called make sandwich, but one thing that happens when you're programming is that things change in functionality over time. And so now we want to make our sandwich and eat it too. Well, I also um, feel like a lot of times when people are making a sandwich, they eat some of it while they're making it as well. Yes. Um, and so the thing is this thing right here, sandwich of five, that's like an identifier and a parenthesis and then a parameter and another parenthesis. And I wanted it to look like um, a procedure call, right? Uh, because it's kind of like a procedure call, but at compile time. And I didn't want to encumber my syntax with having all these different things. Now, um, that's a decision that you could make differently. You could say, well, maybe because it's compile time, it should be different, whatever. I, you know, we're not gonna get into that argument right now. I'm just simply stating what the facts are currently, right? So now you would say, well, and I realize it's, it's a little bit hard to have these discussions when people don't know the syntax of the language and stuff, but you could say, well, sandwich of five here, you can tell that that's gotta be a type and not a procedure call because it's like, it's in the type slot of a declaration. Like I'm declaring a variable, it's got name colon type. That's how the syntax of this language goes. And if this were most uh, imperative languages, that would be true. But the, the thing in this language is because it wants to be as expressive and powerful as possible, types are also values, right? So you can say something like way down here in main, I could say uh, T is sandwich of five. Uh, and what this says is I'm just making a new variable. The type, I'm leaving it blank. So it's going to be whatever the type of the right hand side expression is, which is sandwich of five, right? Now, this could be, if sandwich is a function, this could mean call a function. If sandwich is a struct, it could mean the type of a struct with five meat slices, right? We could change it to cheese slices maybe for the, for the, veg, the veggies. That wouldn't help a vegan. Yeah, but you know, we can only accommodate people so far. So yeah, you know, I feel like that is stretching cheese. it to the breaking point. Yeah. Um, I heard uh, Swiss cheese is a good coronavirus cure too. Oh, so, yeah. perfect. Um, so Still anyway, so, so what actually happens in the compiler is when we decide that something's a procedure call, I actually call it procedure call right in the parser, but it's not really a procedure call. It's like, it's an invocation of something that could either be a struct invocation or could be uh, calling a procedure, and you don't actually, at the end of the parsing phase, know which of those is which. You can't possibly know because make sandwich could be defined like 17 files away, right? And we don't have header files here. So you don't know until you know what make sandwich is, whether it's a struct or not, right? And so, um, but that doesn't actually matter. That doesn't introduce, if you set it up properly, that doesn't introduce any real problem actually, right? Because like your, your parser doesn't actually have to know 
which of these it is. All it has to do is conform to a well-defined interface that is sufficient for the rest of the compiler to do its job, right? And the rest of the compiler says, okay, well, whenever I have like a name followed by parentheses and some arguments, this actually, you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be a name. It could be a more complicated expression, even though usually it's a name. Um, when you see that, you just have to put it into the right data structure and pass it on, right? So that's all fine. The thing that would be, um, that would cause a problem is like, say if this was a struct that uh, plus seven actually meant instantiate the struct seven times or whatever, right? But down here, it's like, you know, taking the return value of a function and adding seven. Those are really different. And if you had to know that at parse time, um, you would be in trouble because then you'd be requiring on the, you'd be required to know the context of this thing. That's a very bad thing to do in a modern programming languages. Many languages still do it, but whatever. Um, you, you should avoid it. Um, now that said, even in this case, you could like, you know, you could start playing games where you incorporate the plus and then you factor it out later if you know that it's a thing, like a, a function call, whatever. Anyway, so that is all just to say that um, You, you can make your job tremendously easier or tremendously harder by making various decisions in the right way, which I guess is not, not that different from any kind of programming. And, and that's kind of what I want to say is this is just any kind of programming, right? It just happens to be a compiler. Like compilers well, one, are way too mysticized. One thing I would add in there is I feel like this is just yet another example, too, of drawing the line in the correct place, exactly like the lexer and the parser, where they're just those are two parsers and you're splitting them in half because it's easier to do some things in one place and some things, uh, you know, sort of in the next place. I mean, really, that's all that's happening here. Effectively, what you're saying is I'm not going to do all of the parsing in the parser, just like I didn't do all of the parsing in the lexer. I do some of the parsing in the lexer, then I move like, to be more concrete about it, yeah. a lexer goes ahead and says, this thing looks like an identifier. But what's an identifier? Well, an identifier is really just saying, I don't know what this thing is, but it's one of these 10 possible things, a type, a variable, a this, a that, right? Yeah. So when you, yeah. when you use a ter one, one of the tokens that comes out of the lexer is sort of like a thing that says, I don't know which one this is, but it's any one of these possibilities, and it will get resolved in a later stage. The parser then is getting you down to a much narrower set, but there's nothing that says it has to be the final set. So instead of looking at something and saying, I have to have the parser determine if this is a function call or something else, instead, I can just have another type of token that's output from the parser that basically says, it's one of these two things I don't know which, and I don't care someone yeah. later on will figure out which one it is, yeah. right? And so it, it feels like basically the exact same process applied again. And by continually kicking that can down the road, you can make sure that you put those decisions at specifically the part in the code where they are easiest to handle instead of doing all of this extra work to handle them in places where really it's very cumbersome and inappropriate. Yeah. Okay, so somebody asked a question, uh, and, and the question is, I think I get why you're doing things the way you are, but what if you want to change the syntax of the language later? Wouldn't you have to redo everything? And the answer is uh, no, but also it's not like doing it the other way means that you don't have to redo everything also. So there's this mistaken, just like you know, using somebody's game engine or whatever, there's this mistaken idea that the fact that you're using someone's pre-existing code or pre-existing framework or structure somehow makes you a lot more flexible later on when you're changing things around. And the problem is that's almost never true because um, to steal a, a phrase from Mike Acton, like the problem is the problem. Like maybe I would change the grammar of this language to something that's very close to the current grammar and that's a very easy problem, right? maybe I would change it to something that's totally different. And um, that might be quite a big change. And in that case, I might end up rewriting the majority of the parser. The system, like the general structure of the way the parser works would stay the same. The lexer would probably mostly stay the same. You would, you would change some stuff there. 
But, you know, most of this stuff would be preserved in that kind of a change, except the, the problem is the problem, right? So this thing that I just said right now about, oh, we're going to defer this procedure call versus struct instantiation till later. Well, in a different grammar, the right decisions of how to do that are going to be different things. And you need to sit down and think about those and make them work. Uh, and that's just the work that you have to do. That's, that's what the new grammar requires you to do in order to do a good job. Well, grammar plus language semantics, right? Um, so it's a little bit, there's a little bit of magical thinking. And, you know, it's this again, I don't want to rant about this for very long because we always say this stuff, but it's, it's, it's like the magical thinking that the object-oriented people do where they say, well, I factored my thing into an object, and so now it's going to be easier for you to modify and reuse the object. And the thing is, that's actually not really true. Like, you're just putting up walls that make it harder for me to work with your code most of the time, um, and also that make it inefficient and all these things that I usually say. Um, but like the, the promised benefits of doing all these things never seem to materialize, right? And so way back when I was doing my first 10 programming languages in school and shortly afterward, one reason why I switched off these parser tools is because the promises didn't really materialize. Like the amount, of, the amount of work that I had to do to change a Yak script from one language to a variant of that language was more than if I hand wrote the code myself. That was basically always true. And it's usually not clear to me, like sometimes domain specific languages can be very powerful when a small amount of articulation in that language produces a very large amount of machine code. Because, okay, you know, that makes some sense. But the thing that's weird about Yak in particular is the amount of actual, like, physical C code you have to write to parse something that Yak parses is not that much larger than the Yak script. And so you're kind of just writing the same thing a different way. And when you write it in that different way, now you accept all of the limitations of Yak, whereas before you had no limitations at all. So it's, it's a particularly unsuited problem to domain specific languages, in my opinion, just because parsing is not that complicated compared to what you have to tell the parser in the first place, Yeah, the parser generator. Also, the other thing I'll say about domain specific languages, um, if you're gonna use one, which I usually recommend you don't, but there are, for example, sometimes when it makes sense, like say you've got a big game engine and a giant team making a video game and you want the people building the levels to be able to do some simple stuff, like have some particles appear when you walk through a marker or something, right? Like some set of things, um, you might readily end up with something in the older days, it would be like a little scripting language that couldn't do loops or whatever. Um, in the modern day, that's probably something that looks more like the unreal uh, blueprints or whatever. I, I, I forget what the, one of them is blueprints and the other one is the shader thing, or is it, there's one for gameplay and one for shaders, but whatever, some little thing where you connect boxes and lines and, and whatnot. And that's a domain specific language. Now in that case, there are two things about that. One is it's the people who are trying to use this thing aren't going to sit down and program in C++ or whatever. So it's just not feasible to do that a different way. But secondly, you're getting a very large amount of mileage out of that domain specific language. Because if you multiply the number of people times the number of years, probably, uh, but you could measure in months that, that each person works on the game times the amount of work that they're able to do with that system, the number ends up being quite large, right? Um, if you look at something like parsing your programming language, should I use a domain specific language for this? You want to do a similar, similar calculus. And the problem is there's not hopefully like a giant team of users of this thing because a parser for a reasonable language can be done just by one person. And it's not like you're going to be constantly building out syntax for years, I hope, or you'd end up with an incredible maze of syntax, right? C++. Which, yeah, well, <laughs> it should be something that you mostly build and then you occasionally modify, right? So if you look at how much do I win for using a domain-specific language here, the win is small, simply because those kind of giant team combinatorics are not there. Um, and what you pay might be quite large. So, uh, yeah. 
And one of the examples of things you pay is exactly the kinds of, I mean, you can, you can almost analogize it to any of the sorts of things like John was saying. The things you pay are exactly the same kinds of things. In a parser that you just sat down and wrote, you can do whatever you want. You can create any kinds of tracking structures or look asides or arbitrary crap that you want to do to parse the language the way you want to parse it and add features. When you're using something that generates, you get none of those things. And it's very much like you know saying you're going to use a scene graph renderer or whatever for your game. You are stuck with just the way that this thing conceptualizes it. And if you want to go outside that thing, like in Yak, for example, you're back to writing it yourself anyway, because now you've got to add all this extra C code into the Yak that's doing what you want to do. It's just it, all of the same reasons you wouldn't really want to do this in a lot of other cases where you don't really want to use a Procrustean sort of data-driven way to generate something that's essentially fairly code heavy, um, or I should say fairly branchy, like fairly logical. Uh, it, you know, it, you just don't want to do it here either. It's not a shader. Right. Yeah. It's it's not like that. It's a very decision based thing. And those tend to want to have handwritten types of, you know, of flow control. Yeah, I would go a little further because it's not even just that you're back to writing it by yourself, but you now have a harder job because you have to fit the thing into mm -hmm. a structure that somebody else chose. That yeah. is probably not the optimal structure for the thing that you want to do. It's a lot like why I why I tell people that like event driven programming is bad or whatever. Right. Because you're you're forced into this structure of responding to events instead of just like doing what you want to do when you want to do it. Like flow control, l l l let me make the analogy to event driven structures a little bit clearer. Like, you know, t typically the interface, you know, that you have in a program like Yak or any of its uh, descendants um, is like, okay, when you see this symbol, then you run this following code snippet. W when this line of symbols reduces, to this thing, run this piece of code snippet and whatever. And so you insert the code into the little boxes, right? But code can't cross boxes very easily. Um, you can't, it, it's very annoying and difficult to go outside that structure. Um, and you can do it, but the more that you do it, the more you're not really using what's supposed to be good about the tool, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and so the thing that I always say about programming is that I've, I've often tried to use these very specific things like event-driven programming or like, you know, logic programming, like in Prolog or whatever. Um, and it, it always ends up being a straitjacket that, that prevents you from doing things that you could very easily do, right? And uh, the way that I articulate that to myself is just that the actual most powerful programming tool that you have is flow control. <laughs> right? It's making your program decide what to do next for however long you want it to do it. And as soon as you give that up by shoehorning your program into some structure that doesn't give you flow control, you're going to be regretting it, right? You end up with direct show or something where it, it's, you know. Graphs, yeah. more graphs. Um, so it, I mean, this is probably a natural stopping point. So I wanted to sort of ask you a very specific question before we move on to like talking about trees, for example, yes. which I think will come shortly. Yes. Um, so just to finish off, I wanted, I, I had in my head a very specific question I sort of wanted to ask that has to do with tying all of this together, what we've been talking about. So a typical thing that you will see, and I myself suck at con conceptualizing this, and I really wanted to hear how you conceptualize it because I feel like it would be really helpful to me as well. If we now just want to say, all right, let's look at how does a parser do something really simple, like I want to generate the proper tree for, you know, uh, five plus four times parentheses, three times two plus five, you know, that kind yeah. of thing, a simple math operator. And you can look back through all kinds of crazy stuff. Like there's shunting yard and there's, you know, uh, putting the things into operator precedence trees and mm -hmm. like having, you know, there's, there's reams of things, derivative parsers that people talk about to do this. And yet I feel like that should be something that you can just do in a simple, straightforward fashion. And I feel like you probably do. So I wanted to hear yeah. like, how well, do you approach that problem? So the way that I do it is probably the second best way that I know of. Um, the, reason, 
I like that. The okay. reason it's not the best way is just because I haven't bothered to change it because it doesn't really matter very much. Okay. Um, so let's let's talk about the problem here for a second. You know, whenever you're thinking about parsing programming languages, um, you know, math operations are very simple to think about because uh, they make a binary tree usually, yeah. right? And, and we so, all know what they mean. We all know how they should happen because we went to math class. Let's do a very simple one, like three plus four times five, right? So now the problem is we have these conventions that, that most programming languages want to stick to. If you're fourth or something, you don't care. But for something like just about any off-the-shelf programming language that people use for most things in the world, we have this convention that multiplication has priority over addition, right? So if you were to write this out as, let's say we're gonna do like temporary machine instructions, right? You would say something like A equals four times five, right? And then B equals three plus A. That's kind of the eventual code that you wanna generate, right? Whereas if you parse stuff naively from left to right, you're gonna end up saying uh, a equals three plus four, and then B equals A times five. You know what I'm saying? And this gives you the wrong answer because it's the difference between the following things. It's three plus parentheses four times five versus uh, three plus four times five, right? And all those little math quizzes for geniuses on Facebook all try to trick you with multiplication <laughs> in, in one way or another, right? Um, let me let me take ten seconds and grab an iced tea, and then we'll go on. Hold on. Okay. The refrigerator is right there. So, <clears throat> so the question that Casey is talking about is, if you're just seeing this stream of stuff going left to right here. How do you know which of these to do and why? And it's, of course, more complicated because, you know, plus and times are two symbols, but you have many symbols. And for example, in C, I don't even remember how many different precedence levels there are, but there's at least four or five, right? Yeah, there's many because there's so many different types of operator categories. And again, there's one or two that are unfortunately chosen and that are very error prone. And because of that, uh, I actually don't really trust operator precedents that much anymore. I use parentheses anyway, because it's just my habit. I might Same not here. in a simple case like multiplication like this. I probably don't use parentheses, but anytime you get to like bitwise operators and stuff, I just use the parentheses because uh, yeah, it's it's bad otherwise. Between between the operator precedence rules and integral promotion and all this other stuff, it's see, I, I just like parenthesize the crap out of it, right? Mm -hmm. like, for sure. Anyway, though, the, the parser should do this correctly. And there are other times, you know, even with non-math expressions, you might have precedence being important. It depends on the grammar of your language. Um, so the way that I do it right now is that I actually, um, I just parse it left to right. So I actually generate the wrong tree, and then I just fix the tree up. Um, and so, so the parser that I use is recursive, right? So if I'm going to parse, if I'm going to parse this thing, right? I call a function that says parse expression. Let me let me see if this is a fool's errand, or I'll write it out. So I might call a function called parse expression, right? Uh, parse expression is going to call like parse like sub expression. I'll do two space indentation, and that gives me the three, right? And then we get to the plus. It sees the plus. Uh, uh, peak token get plus, right? And then I'm going to call, uh, well, let's say, <laughs> okay, let's, let's start talking about the actual tree that we're generating because writing out these procedure calls is not maybe not that useful. So we're going to have a data structure. Uh, in, in my compiler, I called it asked uh, binary operation, I guess. Let me see. I just recently changed the names. Whoops, I'm in the wrong file. Ast binary operator, yeah. So AST stands for abstract syntax tree for any beginners out there. Yes, the and, and so all my nodes, I just prefix, I prefix them with that. It's not that important. You don't have to do that, but I do it just for uh, understandability reasons. 
And it has some stuff, but two of the main things it has is this left and right pointer, okay? So when you have, I'm not gonna get out like Photoshop and try to draw anything. I don't have a tablet, it'll be gross. But if you wanna represent like three plus four, as a, as a tree, right, um, you would have this binary operation where left points to another node. Let, let's call this node zero, right? is binary operation. Left is going to be node one and right is going to be node two. Maybe I should have drawn this, right? And so node one is going to be uh, integer. It's actually um, literal, but whatever. Literal uh, integer one, right? And node, or sorry, integer three. Node two, I shouldn't use numbers in the nodes and in the, let's say node A, B, this is node A. This is node B is going to be a literal with integer four. And so these are all things, right? If you're a noob, you allocate these on heap with malloc or whatever, but these just live in memory somewhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is, this is, let's, let's try and draw this very quickly. So you get like a plus, right? With, uh, two things and a three and a four, right? So that's what this tree looks like. And then this is what it would look like if you laid it out as data structures where these are pointers, right? Right. Okay. So wait, this is, I said node A twice. This is node B, this is node C. I am, I am a bad labeler, B, C. Okay, great. So now if I did uh, three plus four times five, I actually do it the wrong way first and then do a post pass. So I do three plus uh, four. That becomes a times, times right? wait. Yeah. Like presumably there's a times node there and four and five are the two children, right? Yeah, I do it. I do it like this, I guess. I mean, again, it's been a while since I thought about this, right? But. Yeah, it's like I, times I, parser was like four years ago or something. <laughs> three plus four times five, right? Um, this gives you the wrong answer because okay. Oh, so, okay. So, wait, real? Oh, okay. So you? I do this. This is what I'm saying. Push down the left side as you go. Um, okay. Yeah. For well, are you sure about that? No. You know what? It's the opposite. Yeah, Sorry. isn't it? It doesn't. At the top? It, it actually okay. doesn't matter which one I do because what matters is the post step to fix it up. You could do it this way. I think. I think the one that I actually get wrong is the opposite. I think I get yeah. this correct automatically. Yeah, yeah, but you let's, would. Right? If we did, if we did uh, five times six plus seven, that's the one that I get wrong. Um, yes. So, so here I would go times. Uh, that makes five. a lot of sense. Yeah. Let's just let's just put it like this. Mm -hmm. uh, except it's plus, well, no, let's, let's be consistent. So I go five times and then I recurse down and parse the six plus seven, right? Yep. So maybe we should have started with an example that I would get wrong. So we're changing our example anyway. Um, yeah. so this gives me this, and this gives you the wrong answer because if you're going to, so if you take in computer science class, you know what you do with trees is you start at the root and you recurse down the trees and do the things, right? So you say, I'm gonna multiply five by whatever's here. What's yep. down here, six plus seven. So you end up multiplying five by 13, which is you know the wrong answer. Um, you wanna multiply five by six first and then add seven. Um, yeah, so this is, and, this is, I'd like to know, yeah. So, so somehow now you detect that and fix the tree Yes, and, and the, the reason, or, or the way I do it, is very lazy and very simple. It's the following thing. I'm recursing down to make the tree, right? Yeah. So, and what that, again, what that means if you're not used to parsers is, so I'm calling parse expression, I'm calling parse sub expression, which in, in this case, at first, makes like a, a three, right? I get a plus. And then for the right hand side, I call parse expression again, right? Because the thing on the right could be a, a function call or who, who the hell knows, right? And then let's, ch let's change to our five times six plus seven, right? Five times, and then parse expression gives us uh, six 
plus seven, right? We're just going to abbreviate it here. Um, I don't know if this was worth doing this way. I don't know if anyone can follow along with what I'm saying here. Well, I can follow um, along, and since I'm, you know, yeah. the one who I, I'm, I care most about me. Yeah, I'm happy. So this parse expression is going back to here, right, and could potentially do a lot of different things, right? And so we get this six plus seven. Now the thing is, because it's recursive, then if you wanted to visit each node afterward, you just do it on the way up, right? So I parse six plus seven, right? And uh -huh. then I say, okay, we're about to return six plus seven. Do we need to do any precedence adjustment here? Let's look at our left and right nodes. Oh, six, oh, seven. Those are both constants. We don't need to do anything, right? So you recurse back. And then this guy has parsed his left. He's parsed his right, okay? And now he says, do I need to do any precedence uh, rearrangement, right? And he says, yes, actually, I see an operator here that is lower precedence than me, and it's not parenthesized, right? So if this was in parentheses, we would have a flag on the tree that, that says we know it was in parentheses, right? Um, we don't do that. So then, uh, you know, what this guy says is, oh, uh, we need to do a little tree rearrangement. And so what you need to do is rewrite this thing from this into, uh, you know, um, uh, plus in the root and then uh, five and uh, time, no, sorry. Um, sorry, the times is over here. <laughs> Uh, five times six, right, plus seven, which um, looks kind of complicated, but it's actually a very straightforward rewrite. Like, you yeah, take, it's like a, it's a rotate left. Yeah, you take the thing and you pull the node mm -hmm. off one place and you put it in another place and all that, right? Um, this is guaranteed to be correct if all the subtrees are correct. Right, you could imagine if these subtrees were like of unknown things that could have wrong precedences. If you yank off a subtree that's very complicated and you glue your thing on, you might not know where to put it or whatever. But because of the fact that I do this upon returning from any node like this, then it's known to be incorrect priority. Each subtree is known to be incorrect priority, right? And so then, gotcha. you know. Yeah. Now that's a little bit gross because you might have to like walk left down a tree or whatever. It's like, it's not, it's not strictly a constant order uh, operation, which is part of why it's stupid. It also, you're revisiting memory where it might be out of cache. It's probably not out of cache most of the time, but it might be out of cache if you parsed a big expression and then you're returning back from it. Right. Okay. So somebody's so asking, that oh, sorry. somebody's asking, I mentioned that there's a better technique and there is. Um, Can I, I ask one more thing about this technique though, before we yeah. go forward? Cause yeah. I, I am interested to know the other technique as well. Yeah. Um, so basically what you're doing there is saying, all right, I am going to fix up the precedence of a particular node as I walk up the tree. And in order to do that, I am assuming that the left side of my tree is correct because that we were doing the precedence on the way down correctly for the leftward branch. Is that a correct statement? Um, Meaning just like you just said before, you can't get three plus four times five wrong. You're just gonna do that right. So the left side of the, of the tree, the left branch of an operator was parsed correctly on the way down, but the right side may be parsed incorrectly. So you're fixing it on the way up. Is that a correct statement? Um, I, I mean, if you get a really long expression, right, then your left side might have a bunch of nodes on it because, um, or no, I guess that's not true. I guess, It's been a long time since I thought through all this. Yeah, so I, I guess this kind of parsing is always going to generate trees that are slanted to the right, right? Yeah, like where, yeah, yeah, right. And and then you're just repairing those on the way up, uh, yes, when necessary. So yeah, okay. Um, so so your left side actually is going to be very simple most of the time. Like I said, people could use parentheses or whatever, but 
you treat that like a parenthesis is just like a force field that you don't interfere with. So you just yeah, see so you don't really have to care because you're not going to need to descend into yeah. those. Any yeah, you see that flag and you go, oh, OK, we don't do that. Now, the place where it becomes slightly complicated is, you know, due to your, whatever the syntax of your language is, you might have other kinds of expressions that are not like binary operators. Like, for, well, for example, you might have unary operators, right? But you might have other things where you just didn't want to put syntactic protection around them. And so they might get accidentally a little bit parsed as a binary operation. It's like, right, uh, right. you know, um, and so, and so the tree rearranger needs to know that. Um, so it does sound like uh, it is at least a little bit complicated to do this because you're basically rolling in the precedence. So the precedence is basically done yeah. as a, basically a filter on the tree that like reorganizes the tree after the fact, but that you have not found to be particularly too hard to write. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, and, okay. and the nice thing about it is that when you want to do something, you just add a little bit more code, right? Um, and you can look at the whole tree anytime you like, you have all the information you might need to make a decision as opposed to having to do it sort of pigeonhole. Yeah, like if you had to do something really slow and search a whole tree to know what to do, you would be free to do that. Uh, you, you probably don't have to for a reasonable grammar. Somebody asked a question that, again, this is typical of questions that I get and I'm gonna pick on it a little bit, but it's important to say again. Okay. So somebody asked, is this more efficient though? I feel like it's better to define rules based on precedence rather than traversing the whole tree. And the problem I have with this question is, what do you mean define rules based on precedence? That's what I'm doing, right? This is one implementation of rules based on precedence. So if you're going to say it's better to use rules based on precedence, you have to tell me what the implementation is and why that's reasonable and why that's better. And for some reason, for some reason, people just take this magical step where they just say, look, I just make rules. Like maybe, maybe because Yak did it for me or whatever. And it's like, no, Yak is doing a bunch of work. It's just different work than this. Right. And so to ask a question like that is it's a nonsensical, incomplete, malformed question until you say this as opposed to this other thing. And meanwhile, I've already said this is not the best way to do it. So like, come on, people. <laughs> Well, I think too, it's also one of those problems with the abstract thinking model that tends to dominate in programming now. It's like, look, yet you have to actually generate some computer code to do this. Like there's yeah. a series of things the CPU is going to do. And that's the only time you can start talking about efficiency. There's yeah. no efficiency until you're measuring the watts yeah. that go into doing something, right? Yeah. So this is one implementation of precedence rules. One way to implement precedence rules is tree filtering. Yeah. Like I'm going to go through my tree and I'm going to rearrange it based on my precedence rules, right? Yep. There are other places you could put the precedence rules, but it's not like you're not having a series of precedence rules. You're just writing them as tree rewrites, yeah. which again, like I, since I don't think I've ever done it exactly where you're saying it, in my head, I don't have an intuition for how efficient it actually is. I would like to go now try it because I'd like to see what that code looks yeah, like and that seems cool. But I would also like to hear now what your other proposed method is that you were saying you think is better. Yeah, so this is the one that's better. Uh, and I haven't done it just because I don't want to bother changing my code right now. Um, there's some paper that says this, um, <laughs> and uh, but I don't remember the name of it. Somebody in chat may know. And, and by the way, I, I want to say again, I don't want to... I don't want to pick too hard on the person answer, asking that question. Um, it's just like, it's good to ask questions like that. So thank you for asking the question. Um, it's just something about that kind of question generally is iconic to me of the problem with the entire internet. You know what I mean? With regard to programming. Um, so let's just leave it at that. Okay. Um, so again, we're gonna we're gonna go to three, four, five again because those are smaller numbers. But we're we're gonna put the times first because that's the one that we get wrong, right? So now we're doing three times four plus five. Um, are you there, Casey? Still? I am here. Okay. I bumped my microphone, so I never know. Oh, right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, what else can you do to parse this? So like I said, the way we're doing this is just by calling functions. It's just like a regular program. Um, so you call parse expression, right? And what that'll do is it, it sees a three, right? 
And then it sees the times. And when it sees the times, uh, it says times means recursively call parse expression, right? Why recursively? Because this could be an indefinitely long thing. It could be like times six times eight divided by 14. Like this could just go on for a long time. So if you try to write some simple dumb program that just handles a fixed number of things, it'll fail, right? And so recursion, recursion means as long as you don't blow your stack up that you can handle a very long thing, right? Ideally in like a very hardened compiler, you wouldn't actually recurse, you would like actually iterate, right? Which is probably something that a program like Yak does do by default, uh, but it's not that hard to do it yourself. Anyway, um, so, so times means call parse expression again, and then in that call to parse expression, right, so let me just put that here. So parse expression, you see like four plus five, right? And, and that's actually, you see the four, and then plus means recursively call parse expression. So you call parse expression, and that gives you the five, right? And then you return things back up the stack. You return, you return, uh, so uh, return, or uh, let's just say there was end of file after this, right? Or semicolon, right? So semicolon means uh, return expression, right? So we return uh, five, right? and then uh, return four plus five, right? And then return three times four plus five, right? So this is basically what is happening written as some kind of pseudocode, right? Okay. So. And this is just what would normally happen. This if you is just, just write it. yeah, this is just the dumbass code that you write. Yes. If you're just going to do this and the yes. way that my compiler works, because I right. like dumbass code, it's very good. And then you would, at this point, if you're using your existing scheme, now you call like on those return statements, you'd call like fix precedence or something. Yeah. I, I would do it each time that we're about to return. I would be like uh, fix precedence yeah. to four plus five. Right. And then, uh, yep. you know, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. okay. But we're not going to do that. Instead, we just, okay, so, so we see what this operator is. Um, let's, say, let's say times is priority 10 and plus is priority frickin' numbers. Uh, times is priority alpha. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Now let's just use numbers. Pe people are gonna have to understand that we have multiple numbers in flight. Uh, so priority, 150. So the big numbers are our priorities. All right. So when we call parse expression, just pass in what is the outer priority that we are working with. And uh, that's not going to make sense for the initial call. So we're going to, we're going to default it to like minus nine, 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 nine or something, right? Like this is a priority that nobody has. It's way low. And what yep. we're going to do is we're just going to say, look, we know that the time that we fail to parse correctly is when we is because we recurse over zealously because priority drops. So if you ever see the priority drop, just don't recurse. That is literally all that you have to do. So we say times means recursively called parse expression, a uh, priority of times is 100, 100 is greater than minus 9999, so recurse, right? So we call parse expression of 100 now because we're doing times, right? So parse expression of 100 is like, okay, here's four. Um, we see plus, but, uh, but priority of plus is uh, 50. 50 is less than 100, so do not recurse, right? Uh, instead, instead, just act as if we stopped at the constant, right? So uh, return uh, four, right? So this then says three plus four, uh, and then either you have an an outer. Uh, 
Right, I see. You know, so then there's an outer the, loop that just so, continues sorry. calling parse expression negative nine 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 until you hit a semicolon. Yeah, or or this thing can <clears throat> can loop and look ahead, right? But so the point is, we have a three times four, and then we do the plus out here, right? So then this would be the left side, right? Like left yeah. equals this, and then we see plus plus means re cursively call parse expression, right? Priority of plus is 50, uh, 50 greater than minus 9999, so recurse, right, parse yeah. expression of 50. And that's literally all you have to do. Um, and again, it probably gets a little more complicated when you have other things besides binary operators. Um, but it's, so the shocking thing about this is there was a paper about how to do this and it's like recent like nobody realized for decades that this was this simple and it's because nobody probably because everybody in academia looked with disdain upon the so-called recursive descent parser so they didn't bother thinking about it um, and so everybody was doing all this shift reduce stuff um, but yeah this is all this is all that you actually have to do Okay, so I want to say that's actually how I think I did it in my most recent parser because I think I read the same paper. <laughs> yeah, no, that is literally, as far as I know, the best way. Um, because, and, and the reason why it's the best is uh, this does not require any fix up, right? It's a little bit, it, it has a little bit of overhead that's in a different place, right? So now you have an extra parameter state variable that's going on. That sounds trivial, but you call parse expression a lot. Like that is that is just a thing. Can I name the paper? I totally don't remember. Sorry, everybody. Um, so the other thing I would add about this method, and one of the things that I think potentially I maybe like a little bit better about your existing method, to be honest, mm -hmm. is again that I feel like I feel like it's easier to actually program the tree manipulation in a way that feels like I'm actually understanding what's happening intuitively. Because one of the things I don't like about this kind of system is it's like, it's kind of got this flow to it that is hard to wrap your head around. Do you know what I mean? Like. It's very easy to visually think about the tree and go, okay, what I need to do is look down this side of the tree to find the thing that's actually, you know, doing the plus and move it up here. It's yeah. like a very visual thing that your brain can understand. Yeah. Whereas this is more like, oh, well, okay, yeah. So if we want to build this tree in order, we can keep track of this integer that basically tells us whether or not we would have had to have rearranged the tree on the way back up. And instead of rearranging the tree on the way back up, we'll just build the tree in that order in the first place. And you're like, uh, okay, but it's hard for me to really intuit, right? But yeah, anyway. I mean, I think maybe... I need to think about it more. You know, if you think about it more, it's probably fine. <laughs> All know. right, so moving um, on from that, and we'll we'll dig up the link. I've got the paper somewhere, so I can at least go find it and send it. But um, let's talk about the tree, because one of the things you mentioned early on, as you said... I should say why it's usually a tree, implying okay. that, that that you have something specific you want to say about why you would make a tree out of this instead of, say, something else. Well, let's talk about other things that you might do, right? Yes. Well, you, the job of the compiler is to generate machine language, right? Um, so why don't you just do that? Why don't you just go from the tokens to the machine language? And the problem is that's too big of a jump because, for example, if you go back to the sandwich making example, um, you don't know how to make a sandwich until you know what make sandwich is, right? And the machine instructions you generate are going to be very, very different. And so somehow you need to figure out what make sandwich is. And that involves in some way storing what you're doing and coming back to it later. Because you don't know what make sandwich is right now. The, the sandwich is somewhere else, right? Um, and even if it wasn't, so in this case, it's sort of a type checking problem. Is it a struct or a function? But, you know, many programming languages would have analogous things. Uh, so so you, you need to record information in a partially digested form and then come back and, and do it 
further later. And so uh, it doesn't make sense to try to generate instructions at all because there's not really any set of instructions that you could generate that would be like a placeholder that would represent partial progress because, uh, you know, maybe it was a macro expansion and not a function and maybe the macro was empty. So like if you generated any instructions to like record the fact that it was supposed to be a procedure call, I don't, it just, it's not the right, it's just not the right thing, right? Um, also though, like I said a minute ago, um, this thing, like th these simple math expressions even, they can go on indefinitely, right? Like you can just keep going. And so obviously your form of representation needs to somehow be able to keep going and it needs to somehow refer to arbitrarily complex things because right in the middle of this, instead of mod nine, I could say mod uh, make sandwich of three comma uh, 17 plus eight divided by 99 uh, mod two, four, and blah, 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 right? And so you need to have a representation that can do all of these things. And so w this thing right here, do not make, like this is a, a silly example, of course, but this is actually why programming languages are powerful. Because they have this modularity where you can take a thing and put it, you can slot things into various places and that's how you build a pro, it's like Tinker Toys or something, right? If kids these days even know what those are, it's like you can stick the stick into the hole and that stick can have a whole bunch of stuff attached to it or it could have a small amount of stuff. And that's a big part about how you get the actual power of programming languages. I might add something to that, which is not exactly what you were saying, but you brought up earlier the concept of like blueprint or like connecting a bunch of wires between things to have them work. Yeah. I would also say one of the big reasons that textual programming languages still by far outperform those other languages at any non-trivial task is because when you can just replace pieces with words like this and you can still read them semantically, it allows you to create things that if you were to look at the routing diagram from them, or even the parse tree of the entire thing, if you expanded out what the words mean, yeah. would be almost impossible for you to understand. But when you can simply replace any given part with a word that refers to some other part, which you already remembered what it meant, this is incredibly powerful. And that legibility is a yeah. huge, huge reason why you can make a game engine in C, but you can't make a game engine in Blueprint. Yeah. And so, um, and, and then bringing it back to the question of why trees? Well, trees are just a good way to do this, right? Um, like a pointer in a tree is, it's of fixed size, right? So the compiler doesn't have to, you know, if I have some math expression uh, that's arbitrary, has a function call in the middle, and like let's say this mod operator is my node, I don't have to make my node bigger to accommodate this function call. I don't have to like expand it. I just point at something else, and then that thing points at other things, right? Now, of course, you have this traversal of heap memory issue that we have in, in modern systems, but if you allocate your nodes sequentially, they're gonna be close to each other and you're okay, right, for the most part. Until you get to like very long expressions. Um, which tend not to happen. What, what tend not to happen, but also even if you start taking cache misses with those, what other expression would you not be taking, or what other storage format would not give you any cache misses, right? That's yeah. like not a thing. It's just once your input gets big, you're gonna start taking cache misses no matter what. Um, so, uh, so trees just are very good for that reason, for this modularity reason. Now here's the thing. This is different from the impression you might get if you go to computer science school, right? Because in computer science school, they talk about all the things you wanna do on trees, like common sub-expression elimination, which is like if you say uh, three plus four times five plus six plus seven plus four times five or whatever, common sub-expression elimination says, oh, you realize that this four times five is the same as this one and you can combine those uh, into like, and then your tree isn't a tree, it's a DAG and you can do all these things. And like, as far as I can tell, 
the future of compilers involves none of this. It's like, you don't want to do any of this. So there's many, so first of all, common sub-expression elimination requires you to know that there's no side effects on the thing, which you don't know early. So you end up doing it later in a later pass after types and everything have been generated. The thing is after types have been resolved and you know in principle what machine instructions you can generate, um, then when you go generate those machine instructions, um, you have to do the equivalent of common sub-expression elimination on the machine instructions anyway, because like you're going to be generating, uh, you're going to be generating duplicate values that didn't look like duplicates at the tree level, right? Um, and and you want to generate optimal code, and so if that has to do that anyway, then why doesn't that just do it? And then you could say, well, but if you if you notice a common sub-expression in a tree then you'll save yourself from generating tons of machine instructions redundantly and then removing it. And that is true, but A, that's rare. B, if you were really going to do that, the modern way to do that would be something like having a hash value at each node. Yeah, just, just checks on the tree. And you, and, just, and you just look at the hash value when you're generating your register. Like, I, this is where things get confused. Your intermediate value... Uh, like I call them registers in, in the intermediate representation that I have here, but they're not actual machine registers on the target machine. They're like, you know, virtual registers where you have any number of them. I forget what the official compiler hat term is for those. Um, but the point being, uh, you, you define values, right? And this is value number 17 is whatever the result of this tree is, right? And uh, you know, are you that, talking basically about single static assignment form, quote unquote? Kind of, right? Well, okay. there are various things like that. So, so a thing that's looser than single static assignment is uh, like three address code, right? Three address code is kind of this assembly language like thing where you say assign A to B op C, right? Where op and B and C are. B and C are any register and op is anything. And the reason that's not quite SSA is because you could assign A multiple times. More than once, okay. Yeah. And then SSA is like a more strict version of, of that, right? Um, so SSA, by the way, is kind of like entity component system. Not totally, but like everybody stresses about it and freaks out about it and thinks it's an amazing thing but it's like yeah. it's, it's just one way of solving problems that we knew how to solve before it and it's it's also not really a thing like i had not heard about it the first time i was working on something like this and yeah. i just did it that way anyway and it's just what happens when you want to be able to talk about each individual value that is computed in a program so it doesn't it's a weird thing to get really specific. Like, it's a weird thing to choose as the focal point for something you were going to do. Yeah. Well, the, the thing the thing that makes SSA hairy is the fee nodes, which I find hard to think about and annoying. And um, I don't know if you did that that much. That's so. Yeah. Just... If you want to do like loops and you want to yeah. have SSA work through the loops, I yeah. do not grok those kinds of things at all so yeah, it's, again, it's like, actually it's i'm a, not a compiler person so it's kind of like monads where it's actually pretty simple <laughs> but but every explanation that you've ever seen of it is terrible gotcha right um anyway uh but i, I think we're going to lose people if we go too far in that direction sure. yes, i mean yes. not not that i'm not opposed to getting there eventually but it's pretty far from what we were talking about which is just like this is why so so the reason trees are good is not for any optimization reason um, again, like, so, so the hash table thing to finish talking about that, of course, you can have a hash collision. I, I would not assume that two subtrees are the same if they, even if their 64 bit hash matches. I know a lot of people would do that these days, especially the kind of people who do source control stuff. I would feel nervous about that, but, but for me, that would just say trigger this relatively expensive tree subtree comparison that we never do. Um, that is what the common sub-expression elimination people would have been doing in the first place. Um, and that probably never happens. And maybe it's buggy because it never happens. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you can test that by sabotaging your hash function. Um, but the point being that that would be 
not even a big enough thing to consider it a separate pass. It would just be when your intermediate code generator was traversing your tree, it would just do this hash check and say, oh, this hash matches, so go, go use this other value that we already generated, provided that, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Now, there has to be other things, like you have to invalidate that if you're calling a procedure that you don't 100% know has no side effects and whatever, right? So it's, it's not totally simple, but, it, but it's just to say the reason that you want a tree is it's actually a pretty good way to store the data and come back to it later. You do not yes. want a tree for optimization reasons. It's not that great. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to grab a snack again. Uh, so if Casey, if you want to do a soliloquy for like about two minutes while I do that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I suppose I don't know exactly what to soliloquy on. Just talk about what soliloquy. you think about trees or sub-expression elimination or... Will do. I don't know. So I guess what I would say here is that, I mean, going off the optimization thing, like I, I don't really have that much uh, knowledge about compiler stuff, but I guess I have done more work on the optimization backend side of things before. And I would say that, yeah, generally speaking, I don't find there to be uh, a, the, the approach that's taken in a lot of compilers doesn't make a huge amount of sense to me. And the reason for that is because they seem to be really focused on the idea that the way that you produce optimal code is you write some things that try to do some optimizations on trees or on uh, bags of, of operations that you've sort of decided you're going to do. And they try to do these sorts of like pattern matching on those and you know output something. And it's it's very limited with, with what it can actually do. And the reason for that, of course, is that optimization is a very sort of slow process. And they're trying to produce a compilation that's supposed to happen, you know, every time you want to change that part of the program, at the very least, uh, if not the whole program. And so what I typically find is like honestly, I don't really by that mode of optimization. Like if I was going to do an optimizing compiler these days, I would just say, look, there's no such thing as I run a build and out comes an optimizing compiler, compile of a thing. Instead, what happens is all builds are the debug build. They're like the crappy build. And then there's just like a crap ton of cores on my machine that are just sitting around optimizing the functions all day long, all the time. And every time a faster one is found for a function that's still being used in my current build, it gets swapped in. Like, that's what I would do. And it seems pretty obvious that you would do that. I have no idea why people don't do that. It seems like totally obvious that that's how you'd write it. But of course, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. Instead we have like LVM or whatever. So. And then you just end up with these really crappy set of optimizations that sucks, and it's never going to get any better because the amount of optimization that you can do in a single, like, I want to compile and, and use the results after is just not very many. You, you just can't. It doesn't work that way. So that's all. OK. I didn't hear what you said, but um, we will attempt to proceed. I just basically said that I think mashing. optimizers are things that should be offline. Like basically like you should produce a debug build and then your optimizer should just in the background be trying to optimize functions because optimization is slow and forcing it to be something that can happen exactly when you want to rebuild your game every time is just not, I don't see that as a tractable long-term solution. That's basically what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. I buy that. So what do we want to talk about now? So I, th I think I asked basically the questions that I had about parsing, and I think I have a pretty good idea of what you're doing in there. Um, I, if, you know, I guess the question is, how much more talking do you want to do? I can certainly ask about more things, but I mean, I can go for, for hours at this point. I mean, we're only, we, we spent 45 minutes uh, <laughs> just getting the stream started. So we're only... Okay. Well, let's talk in. about a few more things then uh, I can go ahead and, and sort of push forward on this. So I guess what I'm hearing then from based on how you've described it is that if I had to sort of describe the low level uh, stages of the compiler here, we're running a standard kind of lexical pass where we're just building things into tokens. 
We're then running a handwritten top-down style parser that then on the way up does rebalancing of the tree to handle oper operator precedence, which maybe you want to switch to this other way at some point, but at the moment it's not doing that. Um, and then I have a parse tree that's partially ambiguous at the end because, for example, like you pointed out, if I have something like make sandwich and it kind of looks like a function call, well, maybe it is a function call, but for all I know, it's not actually a function call. So I have some tokens in the grammar that are intentionally ambiguous coming out of the parse thing, which basically says, look, he did something that looked like this, but I don't really know what the this is going to be until we get a little bit further. Yeah. Down. Well, I, I mean, I know, and, I know you know this, but you said you said tokens, but it's not it's not at the token lexer level that that happens. It's at the syntax tree node level. So you have, you know, so any tree is going to have some nodes that represent things like function call or binary operator or whatever. And the way you would do that in a C-like language is you have a type tag like an enum at the first slot of the node that uh, just tells you what it is, right? And so um, I actually use the one for function call because it stores all the data the same way either way. And then I just, uh, you know, there's, a, there's some field on there at the end that tells me whether it's actually a function call or not. Um, but you could make an intermediate node that's called like, well, it's either a function call or a struct instantiation or whatever you want to do. And it's not, I wouldn't even say necessarily that it's exactly ambiguous. It's just that, um, it's well, just that the rest yeah. of that distance is covered in, in the type checker and not in the parser, right? What I mean by ambiguous is that much like the Lexer, it's, you wouldn't necessarily want to use the term ambiguous, so that's fine. I'm just kind of using it to say, much like the Lexer says something's an identifier, which doesn't really mean anything because that's like one of five different things it could be. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true here. So it's it's an ambiguous token or an, an ambiguous type in the sense that there's more than one thing it could be, not in the sense that we don't know what it is. We know that it's one of three things. We just yeah. don't know which of those three things it is, right? Totally. And totally. so it's narrowing that down, but it's still not completely known. Unlike, for example, maybe some symbol that literally can only mean one thing at that point. Like it's been completely disambiguated and there's only one thing it can do. Now, maybe sure. there's none of those. Maybe all the tokens are a little, I mean, all of the types that come out of the parser are a little ambiguous because like, all right, well, it's plus, but which kind of plus am I doing? Am I adding two vectors? Am I mm -hmm. adding two this? So I don't know. Yeah. But either way, point being, I just mean ambiguous to mean we can't directly map that to a particular machine code generator at this point because we don't really know what thing it's trying to represent. And we're going to find out a little bit later. But we do know it's one of these X, right? Yep. So moving from that stage on, my assumption is now is the part, now that I've got this tree that has some ambiguity to it in that sense that we just talked about, but otherwise is pretty much structured properly. Meaning the, the things on the left side and the things on the right side are what should be there. And mm -hmm. the fact that maybe we don't know what this plus exactly means, we do know that its sides are correct. Like it's, it's organized, right? It just might not have the exact right meaning yet because we need to wait till we see more definitions. Um, that is when we move to the part of the uh, parsing, I guess, that's uh, incremental. Would that be correct? Sure, I um, guess. So, do you want to do you want to get into that at all or not? Do you mean um, do you mean like the not having header files thing? Or? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I just mean the more general case of like. At that point, your compiler actually, I think, diverges fairly substantially from most compilers, except maybe Montana, I don't know, where it doesn't expect to be able to actually go through and compile a function in one go. It expects that it may have to stop and restart many times. Yes. Um, that's a very broad topic. Uh, so. Let me just try to cover it from a high level and then we'll see what makes sense to zoom in on, right? Okay. Okay, so compilers, and again, this is, uh, this is not me being contrarian. This is a very mainstream view of compilers that I agree with. Uh, they're generally set up as a number of stages, right? Um, what are those stages? Well, you might have 
the parser. Most people would put the lexer as a separate stage, right? And then go into the parser, but screw it. This is too simple to bother with. So we're just gonna call parser a stage, right? And then um, there's like uh, typing, right? Which, which this is like type checking. You could call this the type checking phase, but it's not just checking. It's like you need to know the types of things to do the work. So it's like typing, right? And then, um, uh, well, intermediate representation or something, right? In, in mine, we call this the bytecode stage or whatever, right? Intermediate representation. Um, and then, well, uh, you know, um, let's say uh, machine code generation, right? And then into, uh, executable file somehow, right? So, so these are the steps that you would go through. Now, the place where I differ from the mainstream is that a lot of people would tell you there's lots more steps. There's many, many, many stages. Um, I try to keep things to as few stages as possible. Um, but, but not not fewer than I really need to do a good clean job at what I'm working on. So for this compiler, the exact stages, uh, if we're gonna put lexer and parser together again, so it's parser to typing to uh, message send, because this is what tells your meta program about like what exists, that's a whole, we're not gonna go into that today probably, but uh, once you have the types of things, you can tell other people about your program. So we send the message, right? Um, then we go into like a message wait. We wait for people to have seen the message, right, and, and acknowledged it. Uh, then we go to, oh wait, there's, a, there's another one. There's sizing in here. So you might know what type a struct is, like a data structure, but you don't know everything about all the members. You know what types those are, but, but like you don't know the sizes of them yet. Ah, um, okay. You know, and so there's kind of a chicken and egg problem you run into if you don't break these into two separate things. Um, so sizing here doesn't do anything for most things, but for structs, it's what figures out how big the structs are. Most types of your language you know, like, like if you know the type of something is 64-bit float, then you know how big it is, right? Like, obviously. Um, uh, but, but with data structures, you don't right. necessarily. So any compound um, type, yeah, you need to do yeah. some kind of idea about like what's in there, yes. how's it packed? And all that crap. Yeah. Now again, this is also because we compile more nonlinearly than most people. So in like C, by the time you know the type of the thing, because everything has to have been declared lexically, you know the size of it by the time you know the type of it in C. As soon as you make the struct, you know the sizes of all the other things because they have to have been defined already. Um, whereas in this language, that's not true. And so this is already where we differ. We have a, a, a loose a loose uh, coupling between these two stages. So we go message sending, message waiting, intermediate representation. Um, uh, and then after that, we have the run stage, which is just, if you're gonna run at compile time, you have to have passed the run stage, which involves, um, this is a thing that's changing a little bit over time. But like, say I'm making my intermediate representation and I'm calling some other procedures, right? Well, if those other procedures don't also have intermediate representations, I shouldn't try to call them right now, right? So I shouldn't try to run this procedure at compile time yet because it's going to try to call somebody else who doesn't exist, right? And so if you try to do all that by having people wait on each other in this stage, you're, they're going to bottleneck. So you let people go into a run stage and wait on each other in there. And then, of course, you can have cycles. So you do like cycle breaking in here. I'm sure nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. But um, this doesn't actually even, this doesn't even solve the problem 100% because you could call through a function pointer and you don't know what's on the other side of that function pointer and whether it's compiled or not yet. And so no matter what, you have to always potentially be ready to stall if you're doing compile time execution, um, which is how it's different from actual execution of your final program. Anyway. Um, and I just, I, can, can I ask one clarifying question here as you're going through these stages? Yes. I'm, 
assuming, but maybe I'm wrong, that these are not stages that the compiler goes through, but rather they're stages that particular pieces of code go through, I would assume, because you yes. may need the output of the run to go back into the typing stage or something like well, this, right? Well, sort of. I mean, okay. So in a language like C, right, th there's a thing called a compilation unit where a compilation unit is one file, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, include files are sort of a way that you get around having a lot of redundancy, but the way include files work is they just put a bunch of junk in the beginning of the file, right? Yep. Um, and so in C, one individual compilation unit would go all through all these stages in order with no backtracking or anything, right? Um, yep. And then at the end, it gets written to a .o file. And probably almost every C compiler ever made, in fact, the compiler itself only runs for that one compilation unit and then exits. So if you want to build a whole program, um, you just run the compiler a bunch of times, one for each compilation unit, right? Mm -hmm. This compiler doesn't work that way. Um, or, I mean, it, it sort of does, but our compilation unit is, it depends a little bit on context, but um, I'm not sure how much to explain here. Um, our compilation unit is as small as we can make it, but not too small because if you have too many compilation units, you're spending a lot of uh, time managing compilation units, right? And we want the compiler yeah. to be efficient. So yep. let, me, let me go to, uh, let's go to preload. This is a thing that gets loaded at startup of the compiler. This is in the programming language that we're making, all right? And, or not, not we as in Casey, but, but we as in me and a couple other people. The JAI team. Yeah, so um, almost everything, so a compilation unit is, most of them are top level statements, for example, right? Okay, so um, let's try to find a very simple statement. Okay, here's, here's a very simple thing. This is saying there's a thing called name mapper. It's defined as a type. It's, a, it's the type of a function that takes a string and returns a string, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's one declaration. So it's a declaration binds a name to a value, right? So this thing right here is one compilation unit. It can flow through that set of pipes independently of anything else in this file, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem being, uh, well, okay, right here, it'll go straight to the end because string, there's nothing here that'll block on anything else. But if you imagine that instead of string to string, you had like, string to vet or uh, hello sailor, right? Or hello sailor is some type that the user defined. Mm -hmm. Then we don't know what type this is until we know what hello sailor is, right? And hello sailor might be in a different file. It might be across the universe, right? And so mm -hmm. in this case, this thing would get to typing and it would hang out in typing until it figures out what hello sailor is. And only then could it pass on to the rest of these stages. Right. Right. Now, because we have a lot of tiny compilation units, we obviously do not run our compiler for every compilation unit and make a dot O for it. That would be a disaster. Right. Um, yep. So it's instead something more like, you know, a video game or something where it's a running engine that's just processing a bunch of these things. Yep. And, and so some other thing. OK, so let's look at a more complicated thing. Here's a declaration of an enum. Um, this is actually. Uh, these are the different types of the syntax tree nodes that might be passed to your meta program, right? So we, the compiler has its internal view of the syntax tree, which is what we've been talking about previously. It gives your meta program the syntax tree so that you can understand the program and, and do things to it, right? The version of the meta program it gives you is not the same as the internal compiler one. We do a remapping because you want to be able to change compiler in implementation details without breaking people's programs, right? But anyway. Mm -hmm. These are the different types of the syntax tree nodes, or no, uh, sorry. That's not what these are. <laughs> these are, okay, this is a different, okay. So when you get the meta program with all your syntax tree nodes, there's a type slot on there that tells you what type each node is, right? So like mm -hmm. this one is, is an integer, even if it's a complicated sub-expression that might generate a long set of assembly instructions, you know that the result is of type integer, right? And so right, right. there's this little type info on there, and it has a little tag, and that's what these are, right? Mm 
And so some of these have more complex type info. So if it's an integer, you could tell if it's signed or not. Um, we don't have a size here because that's actually in the base. Like everybody tells you what the size of that type is, right? Um, if it's a procedure, then here's the types of all the arguments, here's the types of all the return values and so on, right? So these are the things we give to your metaprogram. Now, annoyingly for me, um, so this enum declaration is a compilation unit, right? It's a declaration. But everything in here, every individual one of these is also a compilation unit, separate, that flows through the system separately. Why? Well, uh, because one of these, like we said, the power of a programming language is you can tinker toy an arbitrarily complicated thing, right? So yeah. instead of this, this could be blah, 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 plus five, right? or whatever, yeah. and we have to know what all that stuff is in order yep. to do this. Not only that, like this, so uh, the following thing is legal here. I could say pointer is type times two plus three, right? Type is another declaration way down here. So yep. this would be like 29, right? And so yep. these have to be processed out of order. And, okay, because I'm stupid, um, I still support the thing from C where some values are implicit, right? And so, um, oh, okay. You could so you, you can do this. It's an implicit dependency on each serial uh, undefined variable. Yeah, and this actually gets really complicated. It gets a lot more complicated here than it is in C. So if I say float semicolon or bool semicolon, it'll increment the value. The reason I say this is because I'm stupid. Is like, you don't really want this in reality because as soon as you start serializing things, you don't want to like destroy your values by inserting a new enum and like not realize that you're doing that, right? It's very error prone. And so yes. I think it's good style to always explicitly declare your value, uh, but we do support that right now anyway. And so, so if you just have float semicolon, bool semicolon, then bool needs to wait for float and float needs to wait for integer, right? And so enums are actually really complicated because they're all separate compilation units. Um, Someone says, remove that. I've thought about it. Uh, we'll see. Um, anyway, so, but that's not that bad because you at least don't need to wait to know the size. Like the size is just U32. Like U32 is a primitive type. Um, you, you actually can't have an enum of a non-primitive type in this language. So uh, knowing the size is easy, uh, mm -hmm. but, but knowing all the values is hard and we actually don't let you pass the... I forget it, whether it stops in the type stage or the sizing stage. This is something that I'm playing around with. But the point is it, it can't go down the pipeline until all its members go down, right? Um, now, type info down here is a struct. And that is, of course, a thing where we don't know the size unless we know the sizes of all the individual things, right? Um, now, top-level declarations are compilation units. But again, to batch things together and not make things so crazy, the body of a procedure is not a bunch, like every statement in the body of a procedure is not individual compilation units. So let me go to a file here. Um, and presumably that's because there isn't actually a way to depend on a future statement in one, in a previous statement? Um, there's almost no way. There's actually a few that are allowed. Uh, we'll oh, get really? to that. We'll such get to a, that in a second. Such as like a local structure dec declaration, or well, something? so so we allow, for example, uh, nest uh, uh, nested procedure declarations. Like I might declare a new function ah. that I'm only going to use inside this function, and like maybe maybe I just want to put it at the bottom and keep it you. out of the way. Like stuff like that is allowed. So mm -hmm. if something's a constant, that's allowed. But for the most part, the thing is. Um, like programmers have a different notion of time. Like at top level, we don't really have a notion of time. C sort of forces you to have a weird one, this order of declaration thing that's super annoying and causes you to do a lot of busy work. But like mm -hmm. once you're good at programming in C, you know that that has nothing to do with the order in which things happen, right? right. It's just a yeah. constraint that the compiler puts. Whereas in, yeah. inside a procedure, time flows as you go down. Yeah. And so it's very different and so um, we don't need to make this if statement a different compilation unit from these declarations and whatnot, because we just know that you can't you can't do anything down here. How would I say it? Um, you can't do anything up here 
that uses stuff that happens later in time. That's just not a thing that we do in programming, right? Right. Well, and part of that um, stems from the procedural nature of the language. If this were a prologue-like language, that wouldn't be that true. That would be but different, because, yes. Because assignment is like a core concept of procedural languages, you are forced essentially to have some kind of an order because how else does the compiler know which the heck assignment you wanted to happen in which order, right? Yeah. They need to be ordered at that point and hence you pick the, the natural reading order. Yeah, and so now, so anytime you see a procedure, right, um, it's actually two compilation units because the problem is um, if, you, if you wait for this entire body of a procedure to be processed before you let it pass the type stage, then A, at the very least, it's going to be kind of slow and chunky when you try to compile because everyone's waiting for everybody all the time. But B, you very quickly get cycles because it's, it's very easy to have a functions call each other in a cycle, even though at runtime, that's not a problem. It won't like infinitely recurse because you have if statements controlling what happens, right? Um, at compile time, you don't like know that. And so if you say this, this function needs to know the type of this function, and this one needs to know that function, and that one needs to know the type of the first function, nobody ever gets to compile. And so we actually do something just like header versus body in C, but it's invisible, where like if you have this write non-negative number function, this thing all the way out to the parameters, and it would include the return values if there were any, but this has no return values, that is one compilation unit, and that's allowed to flow by itself. So people who want to call this function, all they need to know is what's there, right? And then mm -hmm. the body of it is a simple, separate compilation unit that's usually going to take longer to flow through all the pipes because it probably talks about more stuff, some of which might be remote. And that sounds very simple. It took me a long time to do that. Like, <laughs> that's actually version four or five of the implementation of how procedures flow through the system just because you know you try to be tricky you try to be smart you're starting out building this complicated thing and it's just not clear how any of it should go uh, but in the end yeah it's basically it's basically header versus not header or header versus body just like in C mm -hmm. except it's on a per function basis and you never have to declare the header and so headers can never be wrong for example right yes yes um, so and, and you don't have to maintain them. Function the signature versus function body, two yeah. separate compilation units. They each get their own pass through the pipeline. And presumably, pretty much, uh, your signature is always going to make it to the end before your body does, because you are dependent on your own signature, I would assume. Well, OK, I, I actually don't remember how it is now. But for a while, there was a weird flip that happened where your signature would definitely go first because the body would depend on the signature and wait for it to go because, like, look, if you have parameters, you probably yeah. need to know those parameters, what right? They are. So yeah. yeah. I mean, you could concoct procedures that don't have that problem, but, like, optimizing for those is pointless, right? Um, so, uh, so definitely the body would follow the header maybe even all the way up through messaging. Do I still have that? Yeah, maybe all the way up through messaging, but then when it gets to like the run stage and stuff, um, the body would go first because somebody who calls you doesn't want to think about your body. They just had the pointer to your header because that's what they needed to type check against to know if they could call you, right? Yeah. And so the header would wait on the body to know when it's ready to run. And then once the header passes run, then... Uh, the person calling you is allowed to pass run and whatever. It, all that is changing, and I, I don't think it's great, but that's that's how it was implemented. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the basic idea of what happens. So then one other thing to say about this is, and, and it sounds obvious in retrospect, but again, it took me a long time. Oh, the other thing I'll say, so before I go to that, the thing that makes it confusing and complicated is like, okay, a body of a function is one compilation unit, like usually, <laughs> but then there's features that, that aren't, um, and they, they get weird. So for example, I could say something like, um, 
using vector 3 to, or let's use a module like using the math module right and that pulls in a bunch of names here from something called math right um, uh, that needs to get inserted on its own time um, this is implemented this using is implemented as a separate compilation unit not because it necessarily needs to be in this case in fact, it doesn't have to because, again, the, the time thing, like you can't use these references to math until, until this happens. But there are weird things where you cross the streams. So, for example, um, let's just say this function was, uh, I don't know, took a, took a vector 3 instead, right? You can actually say in the header using v vector 3, but that actually means you're doing a using in the body. Um, oh, okay. I see. And like... It just gets weird. I don't know. I, I probably could go through and, and sort it out. Whenever I stop and, and say stuff like this, I'm like, no, wait, that should be simple. And then I go start trying to simplify it. And I remember like why it's hairy. Using is one of the most hairy things in this language uh, because, because it can appear anywhere and it can cause you to wait on arbitrarily other things. Oh, and again, just because you're using some thing because, uh, so say I'm using math and math has, has some data structure or some, some struct declaration, right? Um, just because I'm using something doesn't mean that everything that I could refer to that that thing refers to is ready to compile either, right? Right. So it's not like once it comes in, everything is good. It's like you have to constantly check. Now, the saving grace of all of this is that almost completely or, or most, of the, most of the thing that you actually have to check for is just identifiers, right? Because that's how your program ever refers to other parts of the program. Um, so, you know, if you say write string, what is that? Well, it's a f another function somewhere, right? So we wait on the identifier, and once the identifier is both resolved to something and we know what the type of that thing is, then we allow ourselves to do this procedure call, right? Um, you know, U8, well, that's a happens to be a primitive type that's very easy to resolve, but same, same thing in principle. N, what is that? Oh, we found it in our own scope here. That's fine. But so the identifiers are the thing that tie parts of your program to other parts of your program. So for the most part, uh, those are the primary things you wait for. Um, there's other stuff like if you operator overloading would presumably. Yeah, or or like um, I mean, operators are just represented as identifiers actually. So when we realize something is an operator overload, we just turn it into an identifier. So the plus becomes the string plus, even though that's not a legal identifier to parse. That's how we store it, right? And so it becomes the same thing. The thing that gets complicated is like you know we have polymorphism so you could uh you know instantiate a function for int and then the same function for float or whatever and what happens then is we just generate the parse tree for that or the, the syntax tree for that new function and then we let it flow through the pipeline again and so when you polymorph something you knew what the type of it was beforehand. It was this identifier that points to a polymorphic function, but then it, you have to wait for it to flow through the pipe and get the actual answer to the polymorph. And that could take infinitely long, right? Um, so th th things like that are where it starts to get complicated. So I guess looking at the way this works now, just, just you know, based on that diagram from before, I guess I would say, like, is is mostly the way that that has gone just been like, look, I'm looking at the kinds of ways that this code ends up running. And I'm sort of breaking this down into stages as I, as I kind of had to. Like, is that basically like, those are the stages that I found that I just had to have as I was trying to figure out how the heck to get this thing to work? Yeah, basically. Okay. <laughs> Because, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming, like, when you look at something like that, you're like, okay, so there's no, it doesn't seem like there's any particular rhyme or reason to it other than, like, look, we need to make these decisions. And this is basically, like you kind of said, you're, you're not trying to break it into these because you'd rather have the fewest, as, the fewest number of stages you could. So this is just, like, this is what you could figure out that would actually make the thing work to do what you needed to do. 
and there doesn't really seem to be a way to condense it down further, at least not yet. No, uh, I am a big fan of condensing things, you know, even just stuff like function calls. I don't like to make a lot of function calls if I don't have to. So I will prefer yeah. to inline them and stuff. Yeah. Um, inline them in text, I mean, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the structure of the compiler is like that. And it's like, literally, this is kind of what it had to be. Now, some of these stages are small compared to other ones. So like message wait is a pretty small stage. It's like, we're just, we're just waiting for something to come in that, that hands us more stuff. It's basically just waiting on a semaphore and grabbing a packet that comes in from someone else and then taking all the things out of that packet and putting them into the next pipeline stage. Right. So that's very small. Yeah. Um, some of them are very big. So the biggest one is typing, actually. Um, this one is giant. Uh, it's comprised of several files, and it's probably, it's the majority of the runtime of the compiler. Uh, it's going to be hard to parallelize because it's complicated. I'm, I'm, I've actually had ideas about how to, how to make it more, like, frangible so that I can and deal with it more, but... Um, you know, it's still, it's still my nightmare is how to parallelize that. Got it. Well, in C++, like in, if I had my own programming language and could add some features, it would be better. Um, Maybe but, when you self host someday down the line, you'll find. Yeah. Oh God. You it's said, just like you said magic. the word now Sorry. everybody in chat's going to ask about that. Oh, it was already happening though. Oh, okay. I wasn't, there was already an entire thing on that. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, I did not mean that to suggest that there is a reason to do such a thing. I was just simply yeah. saying that at some point you probably will be like, oh, I might start writing some of this in JI because it's too clumsy in C++, right? Yeah. Oh, I don't have clock installed on this new machine. I was going to do a line code count. Anyway, so the compiler is currently about 50,000 lines of code. And just the type checking is, uh, so this file is 11,000. Uh, this file, this is the useless header, that's about one. So let's call it 11.2 so far. Uh, polymorph is another 1,700, right? So that's almost 13. By the time we add polymorph.h, that'll be about 13. Uh, copier is another 1,000 if we add the header file. And then there's just, there's a bunch of other functions in other places that are, that are called from this. So... Um, it's about a third of the source code of the compiler is just doing the type resolution and type checking. Um, I'm sure there's a number of uh, a number of other files that are relevant to this. Anyway, so it's just to say that one stage is a, at least a third of the compiler, right? Whereas, yeah. you know, gra grabbing some stuff out that's done with a message and putting them in the stage is like one ten thousandth of the compiler. So these are these are literally like these are the things that had to happen. Um, you know, not anything. Um, not anything. Uh, not anything philosophical, let's say. So. Uh... I mean, then that seems relatively clear. So, you know, I mean, I feel like with that in mind, I kind of have a picture of how this thing is getting parsed, compiled, and, and moved forward. Do I feel like, unless I'm missing something, I don't feel like I have a lot of other questions about just the general compiler implementation. If you want to move on to some other kind of topic now. Well, someone says, someone says this flowchart feels like a draw the rest of the owl type of thing. And like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but... I mean, we're just saying what we, what we can say right right now. We, we can't, like the, the real way to learn how to do compilers is to just sit down and do it. You're never really gonna learn it by listening to other people talk, but what this kind of thing can do is give you like some context about what to try or how to look at the problem or things like that. Um, someone says, would I recommend making a little C interpreter for learning more about these concepts? Maybe, maybe not for C, maybe just make your own simple language or something. Um, it is worth saying that an interpreter is a lot easier than a compiler. It's literally like 10% of the work of a compiler because, um, you know, even type checking is very easy because you can, if you're interpreting stuff, you can type check like as you run the code, you just sort of walk the tree and check that your operands to plus are the right type as you run plus and it's slow, but who cares? It's an interpreter, right? 
So um, that's a good way to get practice at sort of the front end of the compiler. And then, then you can move on to some of the back end stuff. Um, so I don't know. I'm getting very random questions. And so we could do random questions. We could do Casey questions. Do you have Casey questions? So like I guess what I was saying is I don't think I have any more questions on this. So yeah. we could move on to something else, but I think like that's a pretty good structural understanding of like how you did the compiler. And it was a pretty good look at how you're doing the parsing. Cause I was curious about how you tend to write that piece of code because it is really annoying and, and you know, off you go, I get, well, you know what, let me ask one other question yeah. because you did bring it up. We might as well uh, use it as a, as another sort of uh, jumping off point. So you mentioned, for example, single static assignment form and fee functions, yeah. right? Yeah. So how do you conceptualize things like loops in the compiler? Uh, how do you start to work on the code gen for things that isn't just like a linear, I'm um, putting forth the plus? Mm, yeah, the answer for that right now is I simply don't. Um, so not yet anyway, right? So we have two backends to the compiler, two things that do machine code generation, right? One is the one that I wrote uh, that outputs x64 instructions um, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And the goal is just to give me a fast cycle time when I'm compiling, right? So I want to hit the compile button and I want to go fast. Um, so that, that part um, does not try to optimize at all. At some point, we'll start doing some simple things in that backend, like register allocation and reuse, but it like doesn't even do that right now, right? Mm -hmm. So the other backend is the one that gives code to LLVM. And when we want to generate an optimized executable, uh, we do that, right? And so we, we say, hey, LLVM, here's, you know, so Josh wrote uh, most of the code, pretty, pretty much all of it that does looking at our syntax tree with all the type annotations and everything and then translating that into LLVM bit code via use of their heinous and very ugly API um, and very slow API. It's pretty uh, bad. But then, um, you know, that, that generates uh, optimized code for us. And so, you know, the plan is over time to gradually have our backend do more and more. So then what is SSA for? Um, well, SSA is for when you want to do uh, analysis that will help you optimize, right? And so, for example, um, I guess value numbering is what it's called. Like a, about an hour ago when I was saying we have these like oh, virtual yeah, registers, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So value numbering is the official term for this or one of the official terms. And that's just when you have n numbers that assign to any individual intermediate computational result, right? And so you might say things like, uh, well, here's a particular statement that gives us value 17, right? Can I lift value 17 out of this loop? Is it safe to do that or not, right? Um, and to answer that kind of question, it's like, well, what are the operands that compute value 17? Do those, are those constant within the loop or are they not constant within the loop, right? And so you need, that's one simple thing that you might want to do, but there's a wide family of things like that that you want to do in order to make your code uh, more optimal in terms of its runtime performance. And um, for many of those, you need to have a very clear idea about what your values are, when they're constant, when they're not constant, right? And, um, and so you start building data structures, right? You, you maybe have a hash table or something where you say like, oh, value 17 is defined here. Uh, the first moment it could be used is here. The last moment it could be used is this other place. Um, that's called liveness analysis, right? When you know the possible range of code that could refer to a variable. Mm -hmm. um, although in, in retrospect, I just had a weird thought that like traditional liveness analysis doesn't make any sense, but uh, I don't what think do you I, mean? I, I, I don't think I want to get into it on stream. Like okay. I, I want to like think about it because I don't enough. I don't think about optimization that much. But but anyway, um, 
so you tend to build data structures based on that stuff. But if, if you reuse value 17 so that it could change, then those data structures don't really tell you very much, right? Whereas if value 17 is something that like never changes or, or only changes in a very constrained way, right? So like if, if you knew on the entry of a particular block of code, they call them basic blocks, right? Uh, a basic block is uh, a place where you can't jump into and out of the middle of it, right? You have to enter at the beginning, you have to exit at the end. Where you came from and where you go might be different places, but within that block, there aren't any surprises, right? And so as long as value 17 is uniquely defined within that block, your data structures can actually tell you a lot about what's going on, right? And so SSA is a way of achieving that, right? It's a way of saying, oh, um, value 17 inside this block only ever means this one thing. And they play some games with like the fee functions, which is like how you do, because if you write a loop, you know, if I, if I say, if I have a for loop that's iterating over an array and I say uh, x uh, equals x plus one inside the loop, that's a legal thing that you can do in this programming language. And you probably want a value that represents x. Right. And then what you do is you, for SSA, you do some transformation that's like, well, the input is an old value of X from outside the basic block. That's like from a different universe. And within this basic block, we do this. And then if you were to do something else like X equals X times two, this is legal as well. But this X, uh, this X is value 17. Uh, this X is value 18, right? Um, and so, it's just a it's just a way of of doing this conversion, right? Um, and the the fee functions actually help you define what the in, incoming value of this first x is. So now here's the thing about SSA, as far as I understand. And again, I haven't. The caveat here is I haven't spent time working on optimization because I'm mostly concerned with language semantics right now and power of the language. And LLVM is covering the optimization ground for us pretty well, honestly. It's, it's doing an okay job. Um, so uh, when I talked about, talk about optimization, um, my level of certainty about what I'm saying goes down a little bit simply because it's not, it's not what I think about day to day. Uh, these days I'm working on so many projects actually that I think about too many things day to day and I kind of want to jump off a cliff, but um, not, not really, <laughs> not really, but um, you know, uh, so there, there's this older thing that people used before SSA called def use chains, which is just, um, you know, this variable X is defined at a particular place and is used at these places. And then it has a new definition that kind of splits the def use chain. And that definition is used in these other places, right? And the difference between def use chains and SSA is like just data structures. And honestly, def use chains make more mental sense. Um, people claim that SSA is faster, that like the optimizations you wanna do go faster. But honestly, I don't believe what programmers, what compiler programmers especially say about what's faster or not at compile time, because every compiler is like dog crap slow. So, or anything else. That so they have yeah, you're, you're telling me you do all these things that are fast, but your thing is very slow. So so. I, I am sort of like a, you know, the moon landing never happened conspiracy theorist on SSA, which is, um, you know, I, I'm just not convinced necessarily that SSA is a good idea. People say it is, but I don't believe them. I don't not believe them. It might be the best way to do it, but like, eh, I've just had too many experiences, especially working on game engines and stuff where like everybody thought that a specific algorithm was totally the right way to do it. And then you actually think about it and you're like, you guys are smoking crack. Half of what you're doing is unnecessary. The other, you know, a third of it is wrong, whatever. So SSA feels a little bit like that to me, but it might, it might honestly be the best way to do it. I don't know. Um, even when algorithms are right, there's other stuff. So Casey, you've had experience, for example, with GJK, right? Where somehow, oh, yeah. somehow for decades, people didn't realize that they were making it more complicated than they had to, right? Um, and so I feel like a lot of things like are, are like that in compilers. 
Um, well, quaternions was the other one, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah, quaternion interpolation. That you and I have looked into have turned out to be totally wrong after you spend some time actually looking at it. So, you know, maybe compilers are different, but it doesn't seem likely because it seems like a lot of times, you know, and the other thing that, too about it is that probably there's people out there who are making compilers who do know what they're doing and are doing it right. But that is rarely are those the people who end up having the books or yeah. the like, you know, the, the signal of the people who actually know what they're doing ends up unfortunately being yeah. fairly low compared or, to the prevailing FUD. Or they have a very different job from me and other people don't understand that, right? So so yeah. way early in this stream, I sort of said SSA is like ECS. I mean, they're both three letter acronyms, right? But everybody's <laughs> like, oh, entity component system. This is the tech of how you do game engines that I'm excited about. And it's because Unity markets it a lot, I think is the main reason, right? And then people right. don't, you know, people don't have that much of their own experience and stuff. And the thing that I try to get across is, look, if you're making your own engine, you don't want to do ECS because ECS is actually a useful thing, but the problem it solves is not a problem that you have, right? right. The problem that ECS solves is when you are building a general engine that you don't exactly know how it's going to be used and you have some customer who is not you, like whether it's a, several different teams, like maybe you're on the tech team in a game company and then a couple game teams are both using your tech team output in different ways, right? Or you're making a commercial game engine like Unity or Unreal or something and uh, you have no idea how people are gonna use your thing, right? Um, yes. In that case, the thing that Entity Component System does is it minimizes the amount of structure that you are demanding of your customer, right? Which we've just said is actually good, right? Like, right. Um, you know, like the reason I don't use a parser generator is because I don't want structure imposed on me, right? Well, that's similar. Now, un unfortunately, as entity component systems get more complicated, they end up imposing more structure in a different way, right? But from the data, from the naive data structure standpoint, they don't impose structure. Whereas, you know, if you go do Unreal Engine, you have to like subclass A actor and whatever the hell, right? And yeah, that's just a very different situation. Um, so maybe SSA is a very good idea for something like LLVM, right? But LLVM is not my compiler. They have a different job. Their job is to make a general engine that works with a lot of different systems. And that's different from what I have to do. And I don't want to have to do what LLVM has to do because it's a lot more work and it prevents you from taking certain tactics that may be beneficial, right? And so, okay. so I'm not even saying that like any particular system using SSA might be wrong to use SSA. It might be totally the right thing for them. I am just a little bit skeptical from what I know about whether it's really the right answer if you're making your own compiler and doing your own optimizer and et cetera. And the reason, the reason that I'm skeptical is not even anything about SSA because I don't have that much experience with it. It's just what I've seen about the way people talk about it and what I've seen about just the level of belief surrounding it. Um, it pattern matches to me against these other things that I've seen turn out that way in my life, right? That's all. Well, and also I would say it, it, the pattern match also extends down to the level of, well, what you actually mean when you say SSA is an extraordinarily simple, very small thing that we're actually talking about here. So the chances that all of the things that you're talking about are really so related to that particular aspect of the problem are very low, which is the same thing is true of entity component systems. It's like, look, this is a very small, very simple data transformation that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be putting so much weight on it. It's just like, it's like if I said like, oh my God, like, no, you just don't understand. Like the modulus operator is the key to all programming. And if you just <laughs> program with the modulus yeah. operator, it would always, it's like, no, the modulus operator is just something you do when you need to modulus, right? Like that's what it's for. And so the same thing is usually true of a lot of these types of things that people get so over. So it's like, okay, yes, sometimes you do want to organize your data in this particular way, either SSA or ECS or anything else. Yeah. 
that's all it is. That's all you needed to know was that this is a possible way that one part of your code could be structured. It will be appropriate in some circumstances and not in others. Let's move on. Yeah, and and right. also. That's my also, even it's not black and white, like ECS specifically is a dial that you can turn. You can be exactly a little more ECS with some data and less with others. It's just, you know, and that's that's one reason why I kind of get hives from the way people talk about ECS, because it it makes it clear that they're probably not doing good programming, right? Because yes. good programming is like you do the best solution for the problem that you have. And, and so, yeah, um, anyway. Yes. So so to go back to the SSA thing, right? The SSA itself is just a data representation, right? What you actually have to do is say things like, can I move this value out of this loop or not, right? And any way by which you are able to answer that question is a reasonable solution, well, is a correct solution, right? And yeah. then reasonable could depend on how complicated is the code and how hard is it to understand and, and how fast is it at runtime. But there are actually many different solutions to that kind of question, right? And there's a bunch of different questions that you want to ask when you're optimizing code. And, um, and yeah, I just, I see very few people. In fact, I've probably seen zero people discussing this in what I think is the intelligent, reasonable way, which doesn't mean yeah. that people don't do that. It's just, I've never seen it. Like when people talk yeah. about compilers, especially on Twitter or something, it's like, they have no idea. Like they're not approaching it as a reasonable engineer solving a reasonable problem from an open standpoint of, I'm not pre-assuming what the structure of the solution looks like. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, that said, if we do this again in a year, or I probably won't have written an optimizer a year from now because I've got a lot of things happening, but in two years, um, maybe I'll have used SSA mm -hmm. to do some things and I'll have a, a different opinion on it. But right now I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, spidey sense tingling, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I think just that was that was the end of the questions that I had in mind for the compiler then, so we can move on to something else if you'd like. I did want to clear up one thing that I noticed scroll by in the chat, mm -hmm. which is that obviously everyone knows the Apollo moon landing was fake. They, you know, what you saw on TV was from the 1920s when they actually did go to the moon, they had <laughs> photographs of like what the moon looked like Like, there. like the rocket and, sticking out of the moon's eye, you mean? Yeah, yeah, and they took those photographs from those moon landings, which were top secret and no one obviously knew about, yeah. and they just like Photoshopped, you know, I mean, it, they didn't have Photoshop at that point, but they just digitally composited like astronauts from the 1960s as if, as if anyone in the 1960s could have planned to go to the moon. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, really, we've declined since the 1920s tremendously in our oh, organizational capacity. So yeah, yeah I, doubt, I doubt that we could get to the moon. Yeah. You know, so yeah. those were all shots from the 1920s moon landing. Yeah. I mean, everyone knows it if you just even spend, you know, half a minute researching it. But we, OK, so now we can move on to the next topic. Yes. <clears throat> so was there anything else you wanted to talk about, John? I guess you should say, like, do you want to talk market power stuff or did you want to talk about, uh, you know, any other sorts of stuff? I could go to anything. I feel like people are here for compiler stuff. Um, I've definitely seen questions going on. Okay, here's one that someone's asked like five times. Do you pass, do you parse past the first error question mark? How question mark? Um, this is actually a little bit important. So I said at the beginning that- You could you talk know, about error reporting more broadly too, because you mentioned that it's important, but we didn't really yeah. talk about it. Well, like error reporting is the user interface of your compiler or part of it, right? A big part of it. And as we know, C-like languages are traditionally very bad at error reporting. To this day, they're still bad, right? And why are they bad? Well, um, you make a mistake early up in a function and something's the wrong type or not defined. And then you get a cascade of like, 37 errors, not an exaggeration, um, all of which have nothing to do with what you did. And, <laughs> and so experienced C programmers yeah. know to look at the first one, right? You know that unless you are Microsoft Visual Studio, in which case you like scroll down to the bottom one and or uh, make an error list that is like unsorted somehow or makes it hard to find the actual Real thing. And highlight like 100% of the code with red squiggles because that helps you yes, find it. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, 
that is um, important to get right. Now, there are various ways of doing that, right? So one example, so one thing that's super stupid that compilers often do is, hey, you tried, you got undeclared identifier, right? If your C program is compiling a compilation unit and you got undeclared identifier, you should probably just stop at least until the next top level function because the rest of what's in that function ain't gonna make any sense. There's no point in continuing to compile that function as soon as there's an undeclared identifier. However, everybody does or almost everybody does, right? If you wanted to continue, um, there's a thing you can do. I think of it as poison value, but I think technically poison in compilers is a different thing. But you can return, if you said like A plus B and B is undeclared, then you could have B be a poison pill, right? And then the plus says, oh, I'm adding something to a poison pill, so I'm a poison pill. And just, uh, you know not to report errors on poison, right? Um, I don't do that just because it's more effort and uh, it's effort that you have to do like across the entire type checker. And like I said, the type checker is a third of the compiler. So um, I don't do that right now. Later on, I might do that. Um, when it comes to parse errors, um, we will report the first one per file and then bail out. So if you have if you have three parse errors in different files, we'll report all of them. Um, I, undeclared identifier is the same thing. If you have three undeclared identifiers in different files, we report all of them. In the same file, I don't. I bail out, and the reason is because, like I said, compilation is very nonlinear, and um, unless I do the poison thing, um, there's no such thing as like, well, just reset at the next function because someone else is doing the next function and that might have already been happening or whatever, right? So um, we right now, uh, for the most part in practical terms, only report the first error, which does get a little bit annoying sometimes, but mostly it's fine. But at some point, you know, it's, it's, important enough to list multiple errors that it will be a thing that we do at some point. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if we're going to go talk about error reporting a little bit, I do have a couple of things, at least that I've noticed when I've done this in the past. I'm curious what you found. So one of the things that I found was very helpful, and I saw the beginnings of it in what you had there uh, in some of the codes that you were talking about, so I'm guessing you maybe do it as well, mm -hmm. is if you generally always tie back to the original source file pretty much through the entire pipeline. So basically yeah. like one of the things that I notice in compilers that's kind of annoying is I've encountered a lot of different situations in compilers where it definitely should have the information necessary to tell me where the problem is, but it won't. So for example, uh, end of file or uh, no matching, no matching for a uh, uh, closer closer for a pound if or something like this, right? Yeah. And you'll see a compiler that can't tell you where the pound if was that wasn't closed, right? Or something yeah. like this, because yeah. they just they just lost that information. And it seemed to me that generally speaking, it was pretty easy to provide very good information about that sort of thing, so long as everywhere you ever construct new intermediate representations like the abstract syntax tree, they always carry with them sort of source linkage back for every piece that they came from. Yes. Uh, can you comment on that a little bit? Well, you know what I'm saying? That is definitely true. And you want to do that not just for the user, you want to do it for yourself. Because dude, there is nothing worse than trying to debug something you're compiling and you like don't know where in your program this oh, thing right. is. Right, you right. Know? Um, like, I mean, debug problems in the compiler. So all through development, you want to have this thing. I could see how compiler authors from the 1970s or whatever wouldn't have wanted to spend the memory required. Exactly. But yeah. today, come on, dude, like the sum total of all of that stuff is, uh, you know, probably less memory than Twitch uses to draw its chat window, right? So, oh, oh, by far. <laughs> um, Are you kidding me? Yeah. So, uh, you know, don't worry about that stuff. Um, now, that said, I would say that you want to try to go beyond that for certain classes of error. Again, you want to regard it as a user interface. So, it's, for example, let's, let's take a relative of the one that you just mentioned, but a more complex one, right? Which okay. is... Um, 
you know, curly braces. So this language, for example, has C-like curly braces. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, let's say we get to the end of the file and we haven't closed all of them, right? So right now I do report where the open brace is that isn't closed, which I guess is useful, but it's not that useful because any missing close brace could sort of be the right one. At some right. point, at some point, if the missing one is in various places, you would end up with like something on top level that's not legal on top level or something. Um, but, but those cases are kind of rare and they're hard to think about as the programmer. So like if you have a thousand line file and your curly brace is at line 10, your open brace, then at least, you know, the problem's not on lines one through nine, but that doesn't help that much. And so you maybe want to start adding ways of figuring that out. Now that said, most people's editors have like indentation that will help with that, right? They'll like indent incorrectly and you'll see where the problem is. But, um, yeah. you know, it's so, so if you can put something in the compiler to help with that, then, then that's useful. Uh, but at minimum, yes, you want to know where everything is. And that's it for this language, especially we pass all that information all the way to your meta program, right? So I said that your meta program gets the syntax tree nodes and the whole point of all of that is, um, so your meta program is able to look at the program, you know, check it for errors. So you might, you might have certain things that you decide are errors. One example that I use often is like, Hey, don't hold a pointer to an entity across a frame boundary, right? Your meta program can detect that and say, hey, you're not supposed to do this in this code base. You must be the summer intern. You know, here's <laughs> here's the link to the web page to read why this is a bad idea or whatever. And and that's something that the compiler that that the author of a compiler you didn't write is never going to have, but that you could put in your own meta program, right? And so it's very powerful. Right, right. Um, yeah. And so to do that kind of error reporting, also you obviously want to know where in the syntax tree or where the code where in the code this syntax tree node is supposed to represent, right? Um, but then also, let's say I wanna have my meta program export this data into a program visualizer, right? That writes out a completely separate file that then gives you some nodes and you click on like a graphical nodes, like maybe in a Neuromancer kind of thing, or you fly around and see your bitch and program cubes and you click on a, <laughs> you click on a bitch and program cube and it opens your editor to that piece of that file, right? I'm thinking about um, maybe the scene in Jurassic Park where they use the yes. SGI file browser. Yes, this is people. Unix. I know this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you want to be able to do all that stuff, right? And you can't do that if you don't have <laughs> location information. Um, I actually go further than that. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a feature that I haven't uh, really I guess I've done it on live stream, but I haven't told people about it. I guess I told you and Jeff about it, right? But um, there are certain things that you want to be able to do that are classically considered the realm of the debugger or something like that, right? Um, one example that I've added a feature for is stack traces, right? So if you turn this option on at compile time, you can get a stack trace from anywhere in your program that doesn't depend on your operating system and doesn't really take any time. I mean, the time is amortized across procedure calls. Um, so you would only probably do it in debug build or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't, it doesn't rely on the linker not having munged anything. And like the example is byte wise identical on any operating system, right? And I'll just show, yeah. I'll show that really fast for the people on chat here. Um, it's, uh, so basically, in the context, which is a thing that you get all the time, it gets passed invisibly between procedures. There's a stack trace member that has a pointer to a stack trace node. A stack trace node is just this set of fields, right? And then, uh, you know, like what line number was the procedure call? How deep are we into the stack and all this stuff? Um, and so you can walk this at any time. And then it's also trivial to uh, pack a copy of this into an array. So um, uh, I just wrote this. So this pack stack trace function just says, let's look at context.stackTrace, walk it like a linked list, add it to this result array, and then we're going to fix up the links because those next pointers are pointers to memory. So 
the ones that we just copied when we put it into our array still point on the stack, but those are going to go away. So let's just point it to other places in the array and return the result, right? So you can do this. You can call this pack stack trace from anywhere in your program, and you instantly have a cross-platform, very fast debugging stack trace that you could do anything you want with, right? You could write it to a file. What it, the names mm -hmm. aren't going to change. They're not going to be mangled. They're especially not going to be mangled differently. You have file and line information for everything. Um, you have type information if you want it, actually, uh, which you're not going to get out of like uh, debugger operating system level stack trace. So it's much more uh, nimble, right? And so there's a few things like this that I want to have. So like I want to have a thing where you could set a data breakpoint just within your program, right? Now that's again something that you can do like I guess from an operating system level, but if we can set up a language level construct, because like sometimes I'm just printf debugging and sometimes I'm just like, look, when the hell does this value get written? And yeah. like, why do you need yeah. a separate tool for that? Yeah. Like, why isn't that just a function? Like do, do something that I know what it is when this value gets written, right? Et cetera. And so I want to start working in that direction. But this stack trace thing was, was one step in that direction, I forget how we even got on this topic. Um, but well, we were we were talking about how the error message handling is recording oh. things like file and line yes. information and stuff like that. And you were saying you go a step further yes. and you hand that to the meta code. And this is an example yeah. of where you would care about the fact that you could get it in the meta code as opposed to only in error reporting. Yes, and so so the the further thing that I would say about that is. The, the reason why this makes sense and this was a good piece of the puzzle to like work on and fit in is, uh, you know, if you're an experienced programmer in C or C++ or many other modern compiled languages, well, let's just say there's several, there's several times when there's like a safe, comf comfortable zone that you like to be in and then like a toxic waste zone that you don't want to be in, right? And for example, a lot of this has to do with, this is not my main point, but a lot of this has to do with code reuse, right? Like if you're in your own code and you know how things work and you know none of it is like stupid or the parts that are stupid are temporary, then it feels very good and you can get a lot of work done, right? But as soon as you start trying to use someone's API that you don't totally know how it works and it's not well documented and whatever, it could take forever to get anything done, right? So you cross Absolutely. this line where things are suddenly like toxic, right? And you would prefer to stay inside the line where things are not toxic. And the most productive programmers that I know usually stay inside the line as much as they can, both for productivity reasons, but also just happiness reasons, like quality of life reasons, right? I think and you would you probably agree with that. that. Those people probably, at least speaking for myself and also other folks that I see, like you said, you try very hard part of your programming that you're actually doing is working to widen where those lines are like you're actually actively trying to create those lines as you go because if you don't do that then you are essentially you know creating a very small area you can work in so you're constantly going like yes how do i how do i create a wider swath that i can work in here by building out more reliable pieces i can stand upon and so on if that makes sense yep uh, but anyway, anyway, and so so another example that's uh, similar but a little bit different because you maybe don't have a choice is, let's say you call some operating system call or whatever. We've all gotten you know crash in NT DLL right, and yep. you're like, what the hell is this? How do I debug this? Or maybe you call some operating system API call that you don't have any other way to do this task on this operating system, and it returns you know error bad parameter value right. And there's like 17 parameters and they all look fine, right? And, and maybe the actual bad value is like a member of a data structure that's one of those parameters, right? And that's a giant pain in the ass to debug. It sucks, right? Um, there are many, many instances of that. They're just toxic waste areas that kill productivity. And so what I have observed is another one of those areas is basically anytime you have to interact with the operating system in terms of tooling, what people call tooling. So like getting your program to build, right? Yep. Or, yes. or, um, SDK, where is the header files? Yeah. Or, or getting it to link properly or like, yep. 
you know, oh, this library that I built was compiled in debug and I'm trying to link it against something in release. So I need all these combinatorics right. or now. Oh, that, that, that was in 20 visual studio 2017 build, but the 2019 can't build yep. that. That's and exactly, versa, exactly what I was about to say is now Microsoft has totally ruined. It used to be not that big of a problem. You used to just have debug release problems, but now, yeah, you can't link across visual studio versions. So absolutely not. Yeah. You're, you're basically hosed anytime you want to link now. And, and then let's talk about shipping something on Linux versus Nintendo switch versus yep. windows versus Mac, right? It's yep. like versus raspberry Pi. Like it's just a complete disaster, right? Whereas if you stay inside the language semantics, well, again, C++ is ruining this. Because the language semantics themselves are completely bananas yep. now. Yep. But for most languages, if you stay inside the language semantics and you actually know what they are, you can be very productive. And then it's just, oh, I started a new machine and Visual Studio wouldn't load the project file that's 5,000 lines of XML for some reason. Yep. And my precompiled headers are not working right for some reason. Yeah. Like whatever. That's what destroys your productivity. Can and we so pause for one second, please? Because I just want to point this out. Because what you just said happens literally all the time. Like, yes. I can't even tell you how many like open source products or whatever I have like tried to like GitHub and build. But they needed to have their project files imported by Visual Studio. And that just completely failed. Yep. So... <clears throat> the only reason, the only reason why you would ever contemplate doing something like storing something in XML is because it was supposed to be a format that you could have flexibly added something to and not change. The, yes. There's no other reason to do it, yes. right? There's literally no other reason for a textual arbitrary markup language for saving your build configuration. Okay? Well, there is a reason that we'll get to in a second, but yes, okay, yes, I agree with you. So they did the thing that costs you everything. You had to write the parser, you had to have it be slow and big and whatever the, the heck else, all of this stuff happened. And then they still break it every single time. Yep. So what were you, what was the point of that? Like, well, the, there's no adult supervision, right? There's nobody, yeah. There's nobody who's saying, are we getting the benefit of the thing that we did, right? There was some meeting 10 years ago when, when somebody said, we're gonna do this format because it'll give us this benefit. But yeah. then there's no adult in the room making sure that you get that benefit. And so <laughs> yeah. we just get more and more complexity. Now the yeah. actual reason to put it in XML is actually because people are afraid of doing anything now. Because they they're afraid to parse XML files. thing lying around and they were just like, like, that's how you store things. Like if you go to some, like, Somebody will come on my chat, somebody right now will say, but if you write the parser yourself, it might have bugs in it. Whereas you know the XML works or whatever. And it's like, A, no, that's not at all true because the XML is way more complicated, right? Yep. Um, and B, XML is so general that you kind of have to do your own format reading. And like, you don't know exactly what format the subtrees are in and whatever, and you have to write all that stuff anyway. Yeah. And often, often it's more involved than what you would have written to begin with, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. it's It's, it's just not very strange because you see all these decisions. I mean, I guess they're not really decisions as part of it, but you see all these things where you're like, you literally got nothing out of all of these things. Like, it's like that it doesn't, these things just don't make sense together. But yeah, yes. anyway. And so matter. anyway... So, so, so another way that I say this with regard to a general programming language is, look, the job of a programming language is to specify what happens. That is literally what it is. Like this, when you run this program, the semantics of, of this, whatever the side effects, whatever the output is of the machine code instructions that are eventually run by the computer should be determined by the input text, right? That is the job of the programming language and the compiler. So why are we saying that somehow that specification doesn't cover what actually the program is, right? So in C, we yeah. have all these compilation units, but yep. C itself doesn't tell you what the program is. Right. It's just like, well, we somebody else puts together all these compilation units. And that might have seemed fine in the 1970s. It's very obviously a mistake now because the place where all these problems come in is the parts that C doesn't do. It doesn't say that A.C and B.C are part of the same program. So you need all this other stuff. And that other stuff is what fails and causes all the problems. 
So like, why did we do that? Well, oops, you know, and, and so people start doing things like we're just going to include our a.c and b.c into a giant file so that we don't have that problem, right? Yeah, it, it um, ends up being it that ends up being the only way you can actually make a sane build is by doing exactly effectively what you're doing in JAI just with extremely weak tools. We need to be able to build in the actual language, and the only way you can do it is with pound include, right? There's just simply no other support. Yes. So that's what you do because that actually works and is defined in the language, so you know that it will always do the same thing. Totally. Anyway, so that's where this stack trace thing came in. It was, look, this is a thing you want to know sometimes, um, especially so if you're, even if you're using a debugger, right? One common thing that will happen, especially in a game or anything with long lived data, um, you'll make some data structure and then later you'll do some operation on it. And the operation realizes that the data structure is not exactly formed correctly. And maybe there are many sites that could have made the data structure or, you know, modified it so that it was correct and now is incorrect. And you want to know, right? And mm -hmm. tracing those could be annoying. So for example, if I'm a compiler and I want to put a breakpoint, um, I want to know like, well, let's, let's not say a compiler because in compilers, we have this file and line info that you can use to do breakpoints. But, you know, if it's a game or something and I'm like, well, you know, somehow, you know, this, this entity ended up on a non-integer coordinate and it shouldn't be because it's not a decorative entity, but literally there's lots of code that modifies coordinates. So like what the hell, right? Mm -hmm. And um, one way to do that is just when you modify the data structure, just grab a stack trace and stick it on there, right? And then when you hit the actual breakpoint later in the debugger, you can look at that field of that data structure and be like, oh, okay, here's what it was. And that's something that could take you a long and agonizing time to actually do when you're stepping through something. But if you store it when the modification happens and then just look at it later in the debugger, it could be very fast. And being able to do that in a language independent or in an in a operating system independent way has already been very beneficial. Like I just did it on a stream the other day and I found the problem in like 10 seconds, you know? Absolutely, because um, at that point you basically have the power of, you know, a, a really, really, really good uh, tracing debugger, which yeah. typically you have to use an incredibly like esoteric, like you have to use WinDBG or with a bunch of really cumbersome commands to get. Yes. But now you can just do it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the debugger is, right? Yeah. Like any debugger can just be used now and get all of that power, which is pretty, pretty great, right? Now you can do the operating system dependent version of this, which we have, we have a library somewhere that did this, which is, you know, do whatever you need to do on your operating system to generate a stack trace, right? But the problem with that is then, you know, the output is going to be different and how much can you depend on it? Does it depend on whether your program was compiled with debugging symbols in or not, or like whether somebody stripped them or, uh, you know, what's, how do, how are names mangled, right? And, uh, you know, things don't work that you can do with this. So because this is completely defined by the programming language semantics, because again, the job of the language is to specify what happens, right? I can write some code that gets a stack trace and some other code that looks through that stack trace and says, anywhere in here, is there a call to make sandwich, right? Yeah. And I don't have to look for the string make sandwich. I could even compare, maybe there's three overloads of make sandwich and I want to know, is it the specific one, right? Or whatever. I can just do that. That's actually something that's not guaranteed to happen because, um, you know, when there's overloads and functions with optional arguments and stuff in, in a link file, you might have multiple entry points for the same function, depending, like that's all up to the compiler and you don't freaking know. So you might right. take the pointer that the stack trace gives you, but that might be big, different than the one that you get if you refer to the pointer from your language, right? But all that ambiguity goes away. You could even match by string and you know that the string is the same every time. And I can do that right now and it'll work on Linux and Windows and Raspberry Pi and whatever. And that is very far from something that you would even try to do probably. Like I wouldn't try to do that with like a 
stack trace operating system level debug library. Like that's just not. Well, the other thing too about it is that once it's integrated into the language properly and you're not talking about something that is fundamentally going to be sort of a, a separate thing you have to build every time uh, and that's external and specific, it's just like, look, what else do I want to do with this? Once I know I can get a stack trace, it makes it easier for me to write a built-in profiler. It makes me easy. It makes it easier for me to do stuff like, if I want to do a log file that gets written to disk, that sometimes I send, you know, when people are doing, you know, customer support. And yeah. once you have that standardization where you just know that you can do this thing, then you can build everything else on top of it. And it's not this weird like, oh, but don't forget to install the blah, blah, blah lib for your operating system. And like, oops, which version is that? And all this other stuff. You yeah. know, whatever version of the compiler you have, it has this thing in it. So you're going to just get that and it's going to work. And that enables like a lot of other knock on effects at that point. Yep. Um, I don't know if you're getting tired. I could still go for a bit. Um, we could do more Casey questions or we could do general questions. <laughs> it's um, entirely up to you. Uh, if we're just on compilers, then like I said, I think we had most of the questions that I had because right. I was curious about the parsing side of things. Um, but I didn't have a lot of other questions because I think I'm more familiar, I guess, with the other stuff you've been doing. So I didn't have as many things that I was wondering about. But you know, that particular part, maybe you live streamed some of the parsing at some point, but I didn't see it. Right. So, you know. Well, let's do uh, a thing. Let me get up and take a two minute break because I just finished my third iced tea and that has consequences. Consequences. Um, okay. Uh, so how about if we have people in the chat can ask whatever questions they have and you could pick one or two okay. as the question curator and then we can do those. All right. All well, right. we we need to take uh, uh, well. You know what? Two things first. Yes. I need to take a break as well. Then, just so I can grab maybe some some more uh, water here. But then yeah. I'm going to open up hex chats because all the questions are going to scroll by, and I'm not going to see any of them. So I need something that actually has you know a scroll back buffer. Because okay. like you said, Twitch chat may take a tremendous amount of memory, but it doesn't actually store anything. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, go ahead and put Q colon in front of questions you want to ask so we can see them more quickly and we'll go from there. Yeah, well, I can't see those more quickly, but I guess Casey can. Okay, so we're taking legit two minute break for both of us. You all can be thinking about your questions during that. And then when we come back, Casey will be the question curator.